and welcome to the Money Round Zoom party. Today is a special day. Pretty excited about having all our guests and all our crowd joining us today. Uh, just a lot of good people uh, joining us. We'll start off with Bobby Douglas, who's supposed to join us once he figure out the work for Zoom. He'll get on there <laughs> with us, hopefully. We have uh, Angel Escobedo, uh, Chris Pendleton, Nate Jackson, uh, Kendrick Maple, and make sure I don't forget anybody here, uh, Coach Lanham, and he'll be starting us out with everything. We're also sponsored by Extreme Training, where those who like to train with the elite come to train. And we also have Battle Gear, one of our major sponsors. All right, so many people to name. We got so many people at Interaction. Mike Foy of uh, Black Wrestling Association. Sorry, it was Black National Museum. How do you pronounce that, Mike? You cut your mic on real quick. I'm going to make sure I get that out there. National African American Wrestling Hall of Fame. We call it NAHA. NAHA. So definitely want to. Uh, Get that, and I need to get, fill out my membership. I'm slacking. Get on me, Mike. Get on me. I get my membership. <laughs> so, uh, but here's some great pictures of Bobby Douglas that Jake Hill has set up. Got to introduce Jake Hill to so many people. And it's so interesting, his picture with Coach Douglas. He's going to have a picture of uh, Dan Gable when he wrestled Dan Gable. Uh, Mike, would you happen to know the story to those matches with Dan Gable? Mike Foy, me? Yes, sir. Well, I, I mean, it's, it's just only the stuff that I heard. Uh, obviously, I think he won, like, uh, he won eight, eight matches. Uh, and for whatever reason, shouldn't have gone eight matches. And uh, he went to eight matches and won them. Um, obviously, you know, the controversy was it should never have gotten to um, that many matches to win, win that championship. So, um, you know, that, 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 that was synonymous, I mean, back in the day. I mean, even now, you know, there's a lot of uh, discrepancy that happens on the mat, you know, even though we're one big happy family, as a lot of people say. But, you know, um, sometimes you got to go against the, uh, the referee. And I believe that was the, the underlining uh, fact that uh, Bobby Douglas uh, beat uh, Dan Gable uh, the story was squashed, you know, obviously it wasn't very well promoted and, um, you know, and along with, with the league camp, you know, as well, uh, those are the things that happen. Uh, and, um, hopefully we can, you know, right some of the wrongs, uh, with the organizations we get, we have today. Nice. I appreciate that coach for it. Also, I didn't forget my boy, Daryl Thomas. Sorry, Daryl. I, I was nervous. So I ain't mentioned your name. Definitely appreciate you. So first up, we're going to have Coach Lanham talk and uh, definitely appreciate this brother coming on and, and all he's done for wrestling. And, uh, you know, the concept behind it uh, that I was thinking, trying to get the future, uh, future coaches, like uh, future head coaches, let me be more specific, like Daryl and, and Nate, who I know are young guys coming up to be head coaches, present and Matt Kendrick Maple as well, present head coaches like uh, Glenn and Pendleton and uh, Escobedo and uh, past head coaches like uh, Bobby Douglas. So that was kind of the, the point of it. Uh, of course, Bobby, I said he couldn't figure out how to work the Zoom, so hopefully he'll figure it out. But uh, Coach Lanham, with no further ado, just kind of, you know, maybe tell us a little bit about your story and maybe some struggles of for us getting to become a head coach and, you know, what these guys who are up and coming coaches may need to do to make sure they get a job and maybe some advice from Pendleton. Now he, he's out there on the West Coast trying to build a program. Yeah, so I'll kind of tell you my story a little, little quick. Uh, so I, I, I knew I always wanted to be a head coach one day. And, you know, there wasn't, you know, you look at uh, the look of it back then, it wasn't a lot of, you know, just black coaches out there. Uh, you know, you, there, was, there wasn't even a lot of uh, black wrestlers as far as on your, on your teams and that thing. So, you know, but I knew I wanted to, to, to start off and I wanted to be one. So, you know, I, I pretty much I've, gone, you know, I've been in, at every uh, position, you know, from, you know, club coach to volunteer to, you know, second assistant, you know, first assistant, and then finally head coach, you know, and, and I would just say, you know, uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, mentors back then, you know, like I said, uh, probably Coach Adams, Carl Adams, uh, he was at uh, Boston College, he was a guy that I kind of, you know, talked about, uh, about just you know, the hurdles and what you had to do as far as, you know, if you wanted to be, you know, a head coach at, at the university, he said the jobs are 
few and far between. You had to make sure that, you know, what you were doing, your resume and, you know, stood out. You had to make sure that you were, uh, you know, squeaky clean. You didn't have anything in your past. And, and, and then, you know, you just had to rely on uh, reaching out and getting your name out. And, and I found that was a struggle, you know, because I was looking at guys that I thought were, you know, mentors. And, you know, I would say, hey, I'm interested in this job. And, you know, come to find out, you know, I would apply and, you know, they were hyping, you know, their own person that they were interested in. I'd tell them the job I was interested in and they would, they would hype somebody else. So it, it was a, you know, a, a difficult road. Like I said, I had to, you know, to prove myself uh, just on every, every level from the recruiting to, you know, getting out there and, and, you know, and making sure that, you know, I was not only selling, you know, uh, the, the, the program, but but selling my name and my ambitions and what I wanted to do. So, you know, I, I look at uh, Chris and, you know, congratulations on the job and, and the contract. And, you know, one, one thing I would, one piece of advice I would definitely say to Chris is like, I would right now write down a list of, you know, what I want and, and, and get it right now because, you know, you're only new once and, you know, people soon forget you. And, uh, you know, so I would definitely get that list together because that's, I felt like going into my job here at Duke, that's one thing that I wished I, I would have done is just went after more, be more bold, you know, in sharing my vision with my AD saying, hey, you know, I need this, I need that, I need that. And just, and just constantly, uh, you know, going to him with, hey, I'm going to produce a product, but in order to get that, you know, I, you, you have to have those things in order. So, and, and just get your hands wet. Be, be involved with every aspect of your program. Make sure that you get a group of people around you that you can true, you know, that you've been, you can truly trust and be vulnerable when you come in and know that these people are not, you know, trying to undermine you. And then too, is reach out and, 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 and mentor, you know, other people. I, you know, I, I talk to Tion Ware a lot just about, you know, his situation and, and we bounce back and forth, but I've known Tion ever since he was a little kid. So I feel like, you know, that's a person that I trust, but, you know, always try to reach out to somebody and, and, and mentor somebody and bring them up into the program. So. All right. But well, that's a big deal. You said mentorship. I think sometimes I think uh, either our ego or maybe uh, we don't allow ourselves to be mentored by either younger coaches or older coaches. You know, I think uh, that's something I think, you know, has there been a development for programs for mentorship as far as black coaches? I know there's probably one for just coaches period. Correct. I, I don't see much. I mean, you, you look at the, uh, you know, the, I, I see a lot of things open up with the, with the, you know, the coaches association and, you know, all of a sudden you see, you know, one guy in this job or one guy in that job or this job was open and now it's closed. So I, I don't see a lot. And that's why, you know, when I talk to Tion, I'm always interested in like, you know, are you, do you want to be a head coach? You know, are you looking to do that? If you are, you know, these are kind of some of the things that, you know, going in that I looked at. And, and, and these are the things that you have to be equipped and ready to do. You have to know about budgeting and you have to, you know, you have to be ready to get out and you have to have the, and you have to, you know, the coach that is your head coach right now, you have to be willing to do not only the things uh, that, you know, that you're responsible for, but you know, take a little load off his plate too. Like you, you got to be willing to learn about your budget and know how much you're bringing in or, or reaching out to alumni and, and raising money on, on top of recruiting and, you know, and, and retention of your program, know the numbers, you know, of, of, of where you're trending and that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, you have to, you, you just have to, you know, make sure that when you go to an AD and, you know, you're trying to get a job that he knows that you're capable because, I look at my situation at Duke. Wrestling's been around at Duke since I believe, I believe 1929, and eight years ago I was the first black head coach across the board. So I look at that and I was like, "Holy, man, I you know I can't believe that it took you know kind of that long for an institution to say, okay, we're going to give you know a, a, a black head coach a chance." Uh, and two, you know, it wasn't. I was an assistant there and it wasn't an easy, it, it wasn't a gimmick. I mean, you know, I, you know, they, they had a lot of people come in and interview for the job. And, you know, I, I was at a point where I was like thinking to myself, like, man, are they, are they really serious about hiring me? Because it, you know, I, 
I had to throw everything out to get the job. So, I mean, it wasn't a gimme. And, and that's one thing, you know, kind of like you look at some jobs, you know, a guy will get hired and then all of a sudden they'll, they'll close it down. That wasn't the case at Duke. It was, you know, I, w- I was scrapping to get that job. So. All right. All right. So uh, the, the connections you made over the years, did they help you get the job at Duke? I, I think they did. I, th- I think they did. I, I, I relied on, you know, uh, I, I reached out to, you know, guys like Kenny Monday. I bought, you know, when I was at Oklahoma State, he, you know, he was a guy that, you know, I trained with there and we trained with each other. And I would bounce stuff off him uh, just about, like, you know, going into this job. What do you think that the main focus should be? And he said, you know, you, you shouldn't don't, – don't deviate from, obviously, who you are and what you bring to the table. And, you know, because – and he said, you know, on top of that, too, because Duke was like – he said, make sure that they know that, you know, you know just because they're hiring the first black coach – you know, you're, 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 you're going to go out and you're going to be, you know, not only that, but you're going to be even more. So if, if that's the case, he said, always just try to, to shine in the right light, but, you know, make sure that when you go into and you meet the AD, that your, your vision is, is clear and, you know, and your focus is clear and, and what you want to make out of that program. So, you know, and, and obviously you put guys like that on your resume and they reach out to you know, a guy like Kenny Monday and he's, you know, a national champion and, you know, an, an Olympian and a gold medalist, and, you know, that kind of bodes what you're doing too. But, you know, you, you got to have, like I said, you got to have people in your corner that you can trust. And I learned the hard way, that, you know, when you're interviewing for certain jobs, I mean, you, it, you, it's not always good to tell everybody because even the person you think is, the, is, is it going to mentor you, they could be trying to put somebody else in that position. So. Oh, and that's another thing, like, so with your assistant coaches under you, of course, you're trying to mentor them. Is there a fear of, like, your assistant coaches trying to take your job as well? I, you know what, well, you, you can't go into, you can't go into it like that. You know, I don't think you can, because then you're going to slight, you know, you're going to slight them and you're going to slight yourself. And that's what I talk about, you know, in, in, in talking to Chris about, you know, his assistants. I mean, you got to be, you, you've got to have guys in place that when I talk about being vulnerable, that, you know, when you come into the office and you discuss something with them, uh, you got to know that it, it's going to stay in that office and, and they're going to, they're going to always be guys that are going to uplift you. But at the same time, you have to be willing to know what their aspirations are and you can't hold them back. So I've, I've had assistants in the program before, you know, when they said, like, Hey, I want to be a head coach or I want to do this and that you got to grow that process because I, one guy who, when I was at Purdue, I was the third assistant there. I I left uh, uh, UNC. I was the second assistant at UNC uh, Chapel Hill. And I left because I just wasn't growing. I I was, I was a workout guy. You know, I did the recruiting, but I, I didn't know the ins and outs of the program. And so when the job opened up, the third assistant job opened up and, and another friend of mine, Tom Erickson, you know, said, uh, hey, this, the job opened up. You, you, what do you think about going to it? And I was like, look, Tom, if I come to that job, I, I want to come there knowing that I'm going to be mentored uh, to be a head coach. And so I met with uh, Coach Inkle, and I told him that. And, you know, he was not threatened by that at all. He exposed me right away to staff meetings and, and going out, speaking to alumni and budgeting. And there were some meetings that, you know, that required a head coach only. And he would, you know, say, Hey, Glenn, you, you need to go to this meeting because you need to get this experience. So, you know, hopefully, you know, when you, when you, when you get coaches, you want to put them in that position to make sure that they're able to succeed and meet their, their goal. Some coaches want to be assistants for the, you know, for the remainder of their lives, but some want to be head coaches. And I think as a head coach, you have to find that out and then mentor your assistants in that way without, you know, without, hey, you know, this guy could come and take my job, so. All right, so uh, is there any example, I guess, of maybe that you have encountered through, like, maybe you thought might have been either racism or something that you like, this is a hurdle I may have to climb anyway to become a head coach or as a head coach? An example that you may have went through that might can help, help these guys. I, I, you know, I remember I was sitting in, in, in the office and I'll never forget this. And, and, you know, I was, I'm not going to tell where, but so I was sitting in the office and I had shared my vision about wanting to be a head coach. 
And the coach, the head coach at the time, he, you know, he laughed. You know, he was like, you a head coach? And I was like, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I want to be a head coach. And he, and he kind of laughed it off. And when, when that happened, I knew at that moment that situation was not a, a situation that I was going to grow and, and be a head coach because it was, it was almost like it was a joke. And, you know, you look at, you know, the handling, a lot of recruiting, a lot of the face-to-face -face stuff, planning the practices, running the practices. I was doing all those things. And, and you know, when I, when I got that, I was like, you know, I, I got to make a move. You know, I sat down with my wife and I was like, you know, if I, if I want to chase my goals, I got to find a head coach that wants to, you know, reveal everything to me and not, just not look at me as a workout partner, but, you know, a guy that he wants to, you know, get under his wing and, and, and talk about, you know, this is, this is, this is our budget. This is how the way we do this. This is how the way, we, you know, scheduling and, and, and all of those things that, you know, you have to, when you go into an interview, you, you can bring those things to the table. And I knew that wasn't going to happen at that place. So I had to, I had to leave in order to chase my goal. So I thought that was definitely, you know, something that was, you know, it, it was, you know, odd for me to just, you know, get, sit and talk with that coach about, hey, this is my aspirations. And for him to like, are you kidding me? You, you know, and just laugh it off. And I, I definitely felt that that was, yeah, I, I knew I had to get out of it. All right. Well, I got some stories for you that you guys would not believe as a high school coach in Missouri. If I was to send you all these receipts I have, you would be amazed that I'm still standing. So, so I would tell you that. Well, thanks, Coach. I definitely appreciate the advice. We're going to move on to uh, Coach Daryl Thomas. We definitely appreciate him. Oh, now, can, I, can I interject real quick? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Sure. I got Bobby. I, I, I call Bobby Douglas. He's on the line. What? Uh, on the phone. <laughs> He's on the phone, so he can hear you. And whenever you get a chance, you know, to, to thread him in, go right ahead. All right. Well, let's, DT, you mind waiting real quick? Go ahead, man. Go ahead. All right. Uh, Coach Douglas, you know, we have a, a lot of coaches on here, and we just want to hear your advice of uh, – you know, what are some things they, that we should look for to some guys getting a head job and, you know, to guys maintaining a head job? What are some things you might want these guys to know? Let me re recommend you go keep, keep going the way you were born and get, get that information and then bring me in at the last the end of it. Okay. Got you, Coach. Got to work. <laughs> All right. DT, we'll go with DT. What's going What's on, up, man? Coach? That, that Coach Coach Thomas, definitely glad you're here. So, Coach, you know, you just went from one program to another. First, explain to us how that took apart. How crazy was that? Yeah, man. At first, I want to I want to thank you for putting this putting this together, man. Giving us this opportunity to to learn from each other and hear from from other people who are who are in positions of, you know, as a head coach, and uh, you know, us to be able to to gain knowledge and information from them. So, I want to thank you for that. Um, and then, yeah, so I, I was uh, at Old Dominion for the last three years. Uh, the last two, I was the associate head coach. And, uh, you know, we got some unfortunate news that the program was dropped. And uh, this was probably about three or four weeks after we found out the national tournament was canceled. Um, I had actually been uh, doing some Zoom calls with recruits and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, <laughs> actually the same day that we found out, doing a, a Zoom call with a recruit early in the afternoon. And then uh, get a call from from Steve Martin, the head coach, and um, you know he was on the line with the AD and, and got the news. So, um, but was lucky to land on my feet at Campbell University and uh, to have that opportunity so quickly when when not a lot of opportunities were available. Um, you know, I'll, I'll forever be grateful for that and, and and lucky to get that opportunity. Oh, great! And, and we're definitely glad to have you on. So, I mean, as an up and comer in the game, like, what are some of the struggles you already? have seen and are going through? Um, for I, I can speak on for me personally and my, my own experiences. Um, you know, just from an accolade standpoint, I, you see it a lot in, in our sport um, where, where that is the, you know, the creme de la creme and that, that's what matters most um, in terms of when, when guys get opportunities, um, and rightfully so. Um, but I think, you know, it could be a little more research done um, just in terms of what guys have done as a coach and things like that um, afterwards. So for me personally, after college, I had the opportunity to go back home and coach in my high school 
and then spent two years as a volunteer assistant at Northern Illinois. Um, and then at 25, I had the opportunity to be a head coach um, at a junior college that was transitioning to an NAIA program. So um, spent one year there, planned on being there for a long time. We took fourth, um, had a bunch of All-Americans, and then Steve Martin reached out to me about the opportunity uh, at Old Dominion. And I knew I wanted to be back in Division One with that opportunity. And, uh, you know, he kind of explained some things to me where he, he felt like it could be a, a good opportunity to grow my career. And, um, you know, and then Mike Dixon left after the first year and I got promoted to, you know, head assistant and, and uh, really got to get my hands in, in everything in the program, like, like uh, Coach Lanham was saying, um, just from fundraising to uh, budget stuff to, you know, really recruiting heavily. Um, so that was uh, a blessing. And then, you know, obviously things happened and kind of got to reset and refocus. Yeah, well, that's, that's kind of part of the game. I know the football coaches go through it a lot. That, right. when, I used, when I used to coach college football, they always said being far, they said being fired is a part of it. So don't ever sweat about being fired. You just move on and get to the next job. So let me ask you this. I know like in college football, the guys always try to stick together with their group of coaches and work up. So uh, with you being at several different places, have you found like a group of coaches that you think you might can work up with? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you, ha you have people that you talk to in the sport, but I think one thing you see a lot of places where a lot of alumni all, all went to the same place. Like you see the Oklahoma State connection, the Iowa connection. Um, and, and I just feel like at Illinois, we don't have that many coaches. You know, me graduating from the University of Illinois, we don't have that many coaches in the game. So it's kind of harder um, to kind of get in there. So that's why I think this is a good opportunity to kind of get to know people, get to know other people in the sport and, and people that look like you. That I think that helps too. All right. I know you talked about accolades, and I think this goes for a lot of sports where, you know, what you did as a wrestler should make you a good coach. I think people kind of fall in love with that concept. Uh, the interesting thing I know for us right now, you have uh, Coach Chris Pendleton and Angel Escobedo and Kendrick Maple of all uh, national champs, and Coach Pendleton and Escobedo are both head coaches. So do you think you, you, think you may have to have that title? to become a, a head coach at a division one? Uh, I think it helps. I think it makes it, uh, it speeds up your process for sure. Um, it gives you those opportunities earlier. And, you know, for me, it just, you just have to work, you know, a lot harder, get my name out there a lot more and, and, and uh, you know, really grind it out. So. All right. So what, what questions would you ask any of these coaches now that you're, you know, at Campbell, what are some things that, you know, yeah. may help further your career? I think you may want to ask one of the Uh yeah, just some I mean, just uh some some maybe some um some things that you guys have have experienced in the interview process. Um, you know, when you when you've seen a job become open that you wanted to pursue, you know, kind of what was your process and, and thoughts and, and how did you go about uh pursuing it? All right. You wanna get that to anybody wanna take that question? Coach Lanham, you can take it. All right, see you itching. <laughs> yeah, I was going to jump on there and just say for me, you know, the the the, the process and the interview, I mean, you, you've got to really, because I don't know, you know, you go in there and, and, and sometimes a lot of ADs, you know, they don't they don't know what you do until you tell them. And so, you know, you know, you just can't go in with a resume. You have to, you, you have to have head coaching experience as an assistant and that's what I learned you know what what uh got me over the hump with with a lot of these situations where you know they talk you know my ad they, they that's what they they ask about have you ever you know do you know about the budgeting process do you know about you know the the, the you know how how well are you how familiar with you about fundraising and have you ever been you know tasked with doing any fundraising and you know when you can answer those questions, yes, I, I think it kind of sets you apart. But it is, it is a, I think it is a, a you know, a credential school. And, you know, that's kind of a sad sometimes because I think they miss out on, on a lot of opportunities. But it's, it's always like, you know, what, you know, what university did you go to? How many times did you get on the podium? How many times did you win it? Okay, that's naturally, you know, going to be a head coach. So I think, you know, you have to hustle a little bit more uh, in that case. But I, I think, you know, it's hard to, but you have to do this. I think you have to, you have to sell yourself 
and sell your program at the same time without people thinking that you're you're a self promoter. If if you want to move up the ladder, that's that that that's kind of the balance that when I just when I really wanted to make that move and and be a head coach, I had to let people know that these are the things or these are the individuals that I'm directly involved with, and that's where the growth comes from in order for me to move forward. So it's a, it's kind of a a little bit of a balance, you know, where you're selling your program and selling you guys and you're trying to keep your head coach, you know, uh, at, you know, not at bay, but you're trying to keep him satisfied. And at the same time, you're trying to advance your, yourself as well. All right. Got it. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, since you've been hey, at, Cornell, at let me, uh, Cornell, let me hop in on that. Uh, Daryl, right. um, the thing I think that would be is, um, coming in with a CEO mindset. I mean, I, I wasn't a head coach. Um, so when I got the job, I got the job, I was able to articulate my vision clearly. I think it, it wasn't just uh, credentials. I'm um, obviously it's a credential sport, but if you look at some of the top coaches in the country, uh, two of my college roommates, Pat Popolizio and um, Kevin Ward, Kevin and Ward and I lived together for three years and he was a head coach three years before I had the opportunity to become a head coach. Neil Ersman, I recruited and coached him, and he was a head coach before me. And those are both two people that I talked to a lot during the interview process. What set them apart? Because they didn't have credentials, yet they were Division One head coaches. And the number one thing that they showed me was how to set up a CEO, how to come up with a business plan, a coaching philosophy, mission statement, coaching ethos, those kind of things. And then I started doing my research. The research actually, I think, is what another thing that really, truly set me apart from different candidates is I was talking to people that wrestled at Oregon State in the 1970s. I was talking to some of the donors. I mean, I, I, I did the legwork on it. And I think that you have to be able to show that not only are you a good coach in the room, you have to be able to show that you can run a program. Um, you know, with this global pandemic, I've done everything except actually coach. I have not yet got to show a single leg. I haven't got to go into the weight room. I haven't got to do any of that thing. And it's actually helping me. It's, a, it's a, almost fast forwarding my growth as a coach. So um, I think that what you're doing, because I've seen you at some NWCA events and having those mentors is I kind of heard a, a little bit of that. Well, you know, you have your coaching connections. Uh, obviously, my Oklahoma State Alumni Network is massive, and I'm incredibly proud to be a, a Cowboy alum with so many great Black African-American uh, coaches and athletes. But I went outside of my network, too. Brian Smith, Rob Cole, I called those guys. And one of the things that you're going to find out, especially in this sport, is people aren't trying to push you down for the most part. You know, there's some people, bad apples out there, but I mean, Brian Smith and I talked for about an hour and a half, just asking him questions. What did he, what did he see for me being a young coach that I needed to work on and improve? Um, getting into the position to start applying for jobs and communicating that with your head coach. Um, Branch and John Smith were I mean, uh, John and Branch basically gave me mock interviews and started asking me questions. Uh, Branch, especially when I was at Wyoming, he was already starting to try to mentor me and prepare me for head coaching positions. So, sorry, it's a little long-winded, but I just wanted to throw that oh, out there for you. That was perfect. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, so, I appreciate that. Yeah, so, Coach Thomas, we definitely know you're heading in the right direction and, and definitely coming on there. Anything you want to say about Campbell University? What you got going on up there before we switch to the next speaker? No, nah, man, I'm excited. I'm excited <laughs> to keep, keep things rolling. They got a good thing going, so um, just try to add my touch to it. Nice, nice. All right, next uh, we'll have Coach Escobedo uh, at Indiana University. Coach Escobedo, you on? Sure am. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, Coach. No, thank you for coming and spending a little time with us. I know you, you're, you're with the family and everything on Saturday, so definitely yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, so my any little kids are running around here, so if they come in this room, you know, excuse them. <laughs> so, so what things are going on with Indiana University right now? What, what you got going on? Uh, just kind of with, just like every other coach, you know, just trying to figure out how to stay connected with my team, alumni, um, donors, and then 
you know, just trying to move our program forward. I think this opportunity, you know, some people may see it as um, just a burden, but in, in reality, you know, in tough times, you can continue to grow. So that's what we're trying to do as a program. So as a head coach, how much is fundraising a part of being a head college coach? I mean, I just heard Pendleton say he already went, reached to donors before he even got his the head job. So how much is it? Uh, I mean, everybody knows money helps, right? It, it really helps. And it kind of speeds up the process of building up a program. And so you have to show your administration that you can fundraise. You can get your program to where it can be supported and people care. You know, if you, the more dollars you have rolling in, the more that they know that, it can, like, you know, big donors care. And so, you know, I was blessed to when I when I got the job, you know, I started talking to some pretty heavy hitter donors that, you know, are really supportive of the program. And we're going to continue to kind of build on them. Okay, cool. So, like, uh, now, what is it trying not to bump head with particular donors? I know that's an issue, too, right? You got to know who gives the money and not bump head. Right, right. Yeah, I just think that you have to create, you know, some, some type of space. I mean, the donor has to understand that, you know, you're the coach, right? And, and they're not the coach. And I understand that even though they give money, they can't make the decisions, right? The decisions are always going to be um, on the head coach and you just got to support them. We're trying to do the best that we can to make a championship program. And they have to trust and believe you. So you, like Chris was saying and Glenn was saying, you have to sell your vision. You know, where do you want to go? And it has to be articulate. They have to understand it. I mean, most donors have a business mindset. And if you can't sell them the vision, they're not going to donate. So you really have to have a business plan put in place so that they can trust you. All right. All right. So, uh, so how did you, like, come back and get the job at Indiana? Like, what was some of the things yeah, you I mean, had to, to do? So my journey was, um, you know, I was at – uh, Ohio Training Center after I graduated from IU. I went to Olympic Training Center for a year. Then I um, got hired on at Ohio State, was training there for three years. And then um, Kevin Jackson actually gave me my first opportunity to coach in college. So I went to Iowa State. I was underneath his leadership for three years, which, I mean, I can't say enough about KJ. All you guys know about KJ, um, you know, just a great man, a great mentor to learn from. Um, and, you know, I think that he's a tremendous coach. I think if he wanted to, he could be in college coaching now and, and run a program uh, to a championship program. He's just that good. But from there, um, after Iowa State, I got hired on as at Indiana as an assistant. Um, I was a associate head coach for a year, and then uh, Dwayne Goldman retired, and then I got hired as head coach. So I'm going into my third year as head coach. Ah, uh, third year. Third year. <laughs> I know. Time flies. Time flies. <laughs> so, so I'm going to ask you real quick, and then we'll get more into it. But what were you yeah. looking for, like, in a young man that's coming to Indiana University? And, I mean, is that an issue who, you know, nowadays a lot of wrestlers haven't had a African-American male head coach? Has that ever been an issue? I mean, I, I think, you know, what – so learning from KJ, what I learned, like, the most was that just the type of man he was. Um, he was a family man. The way that he, you know, carried himself to whether it was donors, athletes, he gave the best, his best to every single person, no matter who they were. And that's kind of like the way that I want to carry myself. And when I look for kids, I want kids to understand that and appreciate that. So I'm looking for kids that, you know, are well-rounded in all areas, you know, that are, want to be high character men, because as we know, the better your character is, the more successful you're going to be, you know, nine times out of ten. Some people get lucky and aren't high character, for, but for the most part, everybody that's really successful has a pretty high character. So um, that's what I'm looking for. You know, I, I want guys that are going to strive to be better, better people because wrestling is only a small segment of your life. You know, being a good man is the rest of your life. So when you become a father, you're that role model. You know, and and when you become a husband, you're that role model for other athletes to see, for other people coming up to see. So I thought KJ did a really good job of that. Yeah, Kevin Jackson is the man. So uh, we do have a question from Tina. If you want to ask a question to the group, that'd be pretty cool. And uh, Escobedo, you can take it first since you're on. 
Okay. Hi, everyone. I think I know Hello. a lot of people on um, already. If I don't, um, I have a, a rising junior um, um, that will be attending Wyoming Seminary in the fall. And um, we've been in Ohio. We're in Ohio now. Um, and my, my son actually went through a really, 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 if you don't know and would like to text me, I'd love to talk about it. But he went through a horrific racial experience as a freshman in high school. We're from Atlanta. We, 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 we moved to Ohio. And he went through a really tough time. He's getting calls from coaches now. And what is happening is um, he's asking, like, how is your diversity in your program because his concern is that that is going to be repeated. So as you are recruiting, my question is, as you're recruiting um, African-American athletes with the climate of America, with um, not that many of us in, in um, the sport now, um, how, are, how are you guys all dealing with that, um, with the diversity and bringing them in and making sure our young black males are okay? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, so I've been, as of recent, I've been pretty, you know, outspoken about it because, you know, I, so I'm half black, half Mexican. My kids are half black. So, you know, my wife is biracial. She's half black, half white. So it hit, it hits home, you know, and I've had a lot of uh, just racial things happen in my life. So I understand the struggles. And what I'm doing is, you know, I'm, I'm reaching out to the guys that I have that are, that are black and, you know, and that are minority. And I'm asking them, you know, how are they doing in, in this? Because it's important. I mean, it's a burden that weighs on you every single day. You know, it's just not something that just goes away. You know, yeah, it, it's thrown into the media right now as a whole, but as a black person, you understand that we have to deal with this every day. So with that, it's like, I'm checking in with my athletes that are black every single day. Cause I, I have to, because I understand that at some point they are going to be judged for the color of their skin and that's unfair. And so their emotions are going to be high because they're not going to understand it. So it's, you know, trying to help them, you know, as they go through it and share the experiences that I've had um, where people have been racist to me in my life. And it's not easy. It's not an easy thing. And I think everybody deals with it differently. Um, but all you can do is just try to support them as you go through this. And it, it is a tough time. Like I was explaining to my administrators that, you know, my, just athletes in general, black athletes in general, what they're going through right now is that they are losing friends. They are losing family members. They are losing, you know, all kinds of people because there is a divide and you do, you start seeing people's tr true colors. And so you're scared right now because the last thing you want is you know your assistant coach to say something where he's against you and so it's really sensitive right now so i think you know as a coach and as administrators everybody we have to be sensitive to that and really you know check in with our athletes nice anybody else can answer that question as well go ahead jackson you got one yeah i, I like to hop in on that so um i'm just thinking about like kind of the climate um, I think I've been thinking about this a lot really uh, recently. Um, so 4% of head coaches, so three out of 70 are black, right? 7% um, um, of the uh, staff positions, uh, non-head coaches are black. So it's like, it's about 10 out of 160, something like that. Um, and then there's been a decline uh, for black athletes in the, in the sport um, at the collegiate level. Um, since 2012. So um, I think that there's only so much we can do as a as as coaches, right? Because yes, we want to grow those numbers. Um, but I think we kind of got to go outside of the box. Um, at this point, um, I have children. So this kind of hits home for me when, you know, I'm, I'm hearing the, the urgency in uh, Miss Lillard's voice. And it's like, you know, that's kind of what I'm feeling as well. Um, when we reach out to our brothers and we reach out to people who we care about, um, I think as men who have a leadership role and have a platform, um, it's kind of our responsibility at this point to create something and not allow, not wait for NCA to change something to 
allow more representation or not wait for, you know, the, the, the 92% to hire black coaches. Um, so they can, so, so people, so we feel more safe. Um, I think that, um, yeah, this is the reason that I, I'm starting a black wrestling association. I think it's a good time to talk about it. Um, BWA, um, it's, it's, it came into existence to meet, um, the need for black representation in our sport. Um, people look at wrestlers and they say like, you know, we're, we're these honorable people. Like even, even though it's not a super popular sport, anybody, you know, that that's a wrestler, they say, Oh, that's tough. That's hard. Uh, well, I think that being a black wrestler, like we even ha we have to be a little bit more gritty. Um, we have to be a little bit tougher um, because it's not comfortable. Um, I come from, we, we were talking about earlier, the Harvey twisters. Um, I come from a program that was all black and it was, one of, it was a national powerhouse. Um, and I wasn't one of the better kids on that team. I wasn't one of the smartest kids on that team. So why are those kids not continuing to wrestle in high school, right? Why are those high schoolers not continuing to wrestle in, in college? It's not because they can't. It's not because they're not capable. Um, it's not because they don't love it. Um, it's because there are a lot of things that are weighing our kids down. And people want to be around people that they feel comfortable with, period, you know? So... I know as a coach, I'm thinking like, man, like if I have all black staff, um, when I'm a head coach, I know that our, you know, our nation's going to be, why, why do you have to do, why do you, but you know, when it's the other way, it's okay. So, um, I think that we can't afford to let others tell our story. Um, so we have to kind of, you know, take advantage of, um, the moment where we do have some power and, and kind of, you know, combine and figure out the best way to utilize that. Um, I can speak to it a little bit more during my portion when I'm talking. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. Coach Four, you got something? Yeah, I'm just going to dovetail into that. Um, I know that uh, we've, we've, we've been talking uh, BWA as well as the National African American Wrestling Hall of Fame. And that's, that was the onset of uh, most times uh, African American athletes, they're, they're you know, the, the old story of uh, the invisible man. Uh, they're invisible. I mean, you, you have to realize when the USA Wrestling was built, it wasn't, we weren't around. If you do the history, we weren't around. Uh, we didn't build that house. They didn't build that house for us. And that's not a bad thing, except the fact that they're the only, <laughs> only act in town. Uh, same thing with the NCAA. Uh, it's, we have to, and what we've done uh, at Nahoff is, is to understand that we have to take control of our narrative. We have to take control of the platform. We have to have our own media because all these heroes uh, are not necessarily the heroes that they're looking for. That's, that's, that's evident in, in, in the media, uh, when you see uh, uh, television shows or movies made. It's, and, 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 and why should it be? It's our responsibility. So. Like I said, uh, we started Nahoff uh, in January on Martin Luther King's birthday, and it's been going extremely well. And the purpose of it is to uh, have that mentor. You can't you can't know what you what you don't know. I mean, you can't see what you what's not there. And well, many of these athletes, our athletes, we're we're pushed out of the sport, run out of the sport, or 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 just not being utilized. And that's what's uh, I think most of the time it's the problem. So what we're, we're doing is taking those athletes, we're exalting them, putting them in front of the, these kids so that they can understand they do have leadership. I, 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 I volunteer coach at, at, at Leo High School, all black school, all black male school. And the thing that they'll tell me, I'm a two-time Olympian, they'll tell me wrestling is a white sport. And I'm like, I'm, do you see anything white here? And, and the people that I'm telling them about, they have no clue who they are. I'm talking about the heroes, the, the ones that took on gold medals and, 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 and national champions by the multitude. So I, I think it's incumbent upon us to take that, exalt it, put it in front of them so that they can see our heroes. If you think back, you, had a, you have a hero. You have a role model that you had in mind. That's why you're successful. But if you take that away, you take away – a whole opportunity because they don't they don't see it so so like i said i, I think that uh you know i would urge everybody on the call and anybody who's african-american and or not to join um 
NAHOP and B, uh, BWA, we're, we're kind of uh, in partnership with each other, um, dual membership, because it is essential. The old adage, divide and conquer, it works very well, but if you're not even united, it is 100% uh, 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 a uh, success. So we coming together is what we need to do. This, this program is, is essential. Uh, being able to network, communicate, to know about those opportunities. Most time you don't even know. And we should all be able to know what each other knows from coast to coast and north to south. And that's, like I said, is the platform that we're building at NAHA in conjunction with. So. I think, I think too, with, with that platform, um, you, you look at, you know, white kids who are going to college, you know, they're, they're insulated, you know, um, they have um, safety nets as far as just people, uh, resources, human, human resources. Um, if we can create a big brother, um, that's something that starts at the grassroots level and follows the kid when he's going into high school and follows that kid when he's in college, you know, and then after college, if he needs something to, you know, to get involved with, um, this, this is something that I think is needed. It's, it, it's unfortunate that it takes, it takes so much, you know, it takes society taking away so much for, for people to even come up with the idea, you know, but, um, I think that right now, like it's something that is going to be a fixture um, and, you know, getting infrastructure and everything in place. So obviously me and Mike, me and Mike are, are, are in it together. Um, and, and yeah, I urge everyone on this call to, uh, you know, just stay, just stay connected with us and we'll be connected with you all um, soon. Nice. Well, I appreciate that input. We're going to go back to coach Escobedo. Uh, so coach, Escobedo, is there anything else you want to add to that? You got to cut your mic back on, Coach. <laughs> no, I just I just appreciate everybody on this call. I mean, just great people. Um, and I think what we have to do is, yeah, we have to get together. We have to build each other up. Um, and we have to fight for, you know, the black community out there for wrestlers. I mean, it, as coaches, I mean, I could ask every coach in here and we can talk about, you know, recruiting a black athlete and what other people would say around about that black athlete, right? There's always a lot of negatives that go with it. And that's a problem. You know, they're, they're not giving them the chance. It's like, either, it's like the black athlete has to be a freak athlete in order for him to get recruited by division one coaches. You know, the, the amount, I don't get that many black athletes from coaches. And it's like, why not? You know, because there's a, there's a lot out there. There really are. But they're not giving the chance. So I just think for us, we just got to do a lot more outreach. You know, I'm thankful for Mike and, and Nate, what you guys are doing. You guys are doing a great job for all you're doing. And, you know, I want to help out any way I can. I mean, giving back is what we, what we do, is what we need to do. And as wrestlers, I mean, that's the greatest thing we can do. So just keep building up the community. Nice, but I appreciate that. I know just to piggyback off Coach Foy, you know, you like I said, you do have a model. I mean, my first wrestling match I saw on TV was Kenny Monday when he won his Olympic title on the VHS. So <laughs> it's just interesting you said that. And uh, I mean, uh, so, well, I just got one more thing. You know what's okay. kind of interesting, too? When we talk about um, accolades, how accolades get us jobs, right, like sometimes. But if think about how many black – athletes out there that had the accolades that weren't given the chance to be division one head coaches it's insane right it's like why not you know where's the gap in that and um it's almost like their accolades aren't you know aren't taken into consideration you know there, there's very few of all of them that have won world championships and olympic championships that went on to be division one head coaches so um, it's unfortunate, but hopefully times are changing. We got some great young coaches, you know, Nate, Daryl, you guys are doing great things. And, you know, hopefully you guys will continue the trend of, of having more African American head coaches in the Division One landscape. You know, hey, uh, go for it. You got something to say? Yeah, I was going to say real quickly. And, 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 and you know, like I said, my philosophy is 
is is build your own, you know. And I, I use the analogy of um, all the time is that we we, we truly um, um, we're, we're under the impression that they they you know a lot of people well the the uh, society built this for us, and it's not it's, it's just not true. So what we're doing is building an infrastructure. We're building an organizations that will employ, you know. It, just you know, just because you're non for profit doesn't mean that you don't uh, employ folks. So you will have those opportunities. We're building it right now. We're we're ne in uh, negotiation with the HBCUs to uh, uh, increase um, the Af I mean to increase uh, to put wrestling into the program. And of course, with African American uh, wrestling, we're partnering with uh, uh, the National Wrestling Coaches Association. So those are the things that we're doing because we we have we have that control. You know, uh, to grow this sport is, is is going to affect all of all of wrestling, and and what is not being said is that most time when you when you talk about um, the, the shrinking of 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 of, um, of, of, of uh, wrestlers, it's because there a lot of people are not focusing on those African American and uh, the African American community, and that's where we come in and say, hey. We're going to extend it because we're going to make them aware of the different uh, uh, vehicles they can they can actually uh, uh, partake in uh, to to get their degree, get them into school, get them into the HBCUs. So those are those are the things. Like I said, we have control of, and we have to uh, come together, you know, uh, and make that happen because the the rest of the world will listen once you. You know, build a flat platform. They'll say, "Oh, I, I forgot about you know Nate Jackson. Oh, I forgot about you know uh, Expedi uh, Expedi. <laughs> I can't even say your name. Uh, es Angel. Es Escobedo. Angel. <laughs> so you know all those things because truly there's a lot out there. But if you're not making a noise for yourself, who is better? I mean, who's going to pick up the you know pick up that horn uh, when it's your horn to blow? You have to blow your own horn and say, I'm here. Remember this? Remember this guy? And if they're not willing to, to employ him, we are. All right. Good deal. So I'm going to ask this question real quick. And Gasson has one. We're going to read here in a minute. But I'm going to ask this question because it's on my mind. So I noticed like when Sean Charles lost his job, Zeke came in and got more money than Sean Charles. When Kevin Jackson lost his job, Dresser came in and got more money than Sean Charles did. Like, is that an ongoing thing? Even uh, with Jamel Kelly, when he left from Stanford to Arizona State, did Nate Engel come in and get that same job and make more money? Is that an ongoing thing where th these guys make more money when they come in? Somebody can take the question. You know, I'm just asking to the group. I think that happens all over, not just wrestling. Okay. I mean, that's, that's you know, it's a microcosm, it, it, you know. It, it happens in the real world. I'm, I'm, I spent 30 something years in business. Yes, it happens because it's systemic. Racism is systemic, meaning that it is throughout the whole system. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, distinguish between the toe and, and, and the head. It's all through the system. And the way, like I said, you know, I mean, obviously there's, you know, that's why we're here even today uh, in 2020 is because it's in the system. All right. All right. Go ahead, uh, Gasson. Go ahead and uh, ask your question so everybody can hear it, please. Kyvin, you still on there? I guess I asked. I don't know if he's on there. He said, "How many D one um, coaches?" Oh, go ahead. Yeah, how go many? Ahead. How many Division One head coaches have there been at predominantly white institutions? I'm not going to come counting the HBCUs that were um, functional back in the, in the '90s and. Um, stuff, but like, how many have there been at the Division One institutions over the history? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe, um, maybe, maybe Bobby Bob, can answer that. Bob Douglas, there's, uh, there's been four, maybe five, black head coaches, and that excludes the, um, the. Uh, the traditional black colleges that had wrestling programs. 
Uh, oh, that, that's you, Coach Douglas, Carl Adams, Kevin, Sean Charles, um, uh, Fletcher, Fletcher Carr. Was Nate Carr Sr. one? Fred Lett. Who? Freddie Lett from Boston University. Okay. Willie Gatson. Terry, Terry um, McCoy. Glenn. Terry McCoy. There, there has not when you look at the number of black head coaches over the period of years, it's it's obvious that uh, athletic directors were not in the market for hiring black wrestling coaches. As a matter of fact, those athletic directors weren't in the market of hiring any black coaches. If you if you look back at the history. You can see that there is a pattern. Fletcher Carr University was at the University of Kentucky. He started a program. He's one of the first black head coaches. I think I was second black head coach at a Division One school. Uh, but there has not been that many. But and the people that were in charge of making the rules. Minorities. There were a few Hispanics that got a chance. There were a few blacks that got a chance, but not that many. What 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 you what you're doing now is you're unwrapping a history that is shameful as far as the NCAA is concerned. As far as uh, the, what was uh, the, the governing body was the AAU. I, I, I'm the one that made them start hiring black head coaches for their teams. The Federation, the US, United States Wrestling Federation. My coach was Myron Roderick, and I, he and I almost got in a fight at, at the NCAA tournament because I told him, I asked the question, where are the black wrestlers? Why aren't you getting blacks and minorities more involved? They didn't like that. So I got labeled. I was a troublemaker. After I got the job at Arizona State, they said I was trying to create an all-black team. I was trying to create a national championship team, and they knew it. That attitude has not changed among administrators. Our problem is we don't have administrators that will hire minorities. And one, one, one other thing I want to say, one of the keys to our survival is to make sure that we are more diverse, that we are more inclusive. We have to, we have to deal with getting women's programs into the NCAA if you want wrestling to survive at the NCAA level. We have to be more inclusive of handicaps. We have to be more inclusive of people that that have gone over the age of uh, 60 years old. They're, they're, those guys are still very valuable. Your program, what you're trying to do now, and what I'm hoping you will stimulate, you will you will trigger athletic directors to take a look and see what it, what I've been talking about. You're not a, you're not inclusive, and you will also help women, minorities, handicapped. You help bring them into the wrestling family they've been segregated they've been excluded and we cannot allow that to happen because we won't make it unless we are more inclusive more diverse when i said that at the ncaa rules committee uh in pittsburgh the coaches had a fit they they started saying i was trying to build an all-black team and and that i was a racist and and i my my answer to them was what are you talking about? How can I be a racist? You don't have any, any minorities in, in, in the NCA rules committee. 
and they didn't. And so what they did is they started putting minorities on the rules committee. But if you look at the history of the rules committee, you will only find wrestling is how many years old now? It's almost 90 years old, maybe even longer than that. It's only had two or three uh, minorities on the rules committee at the NCAA level. At the freestyle level, USA wrestling level, I had to damn near knock the door down to get them to put people on those committees that were minorities. I, I, I've listened to the stories and the excuses as to why not since I was in high school. I asked that question, I asked why, why are there not more black wrestling coaches in high school. I asked that when I was in high school. When I got to college, I asked the same question. After I got out of college, by that time I realized what was going on. And it's not going to change. And we got to get more black administrators. We got to create more minority friends of wrestling. And it's up to you guys. I mean, they're not going to listen to me. But they have to listen to you. And, and and with that said, I think it's it's imperative they have to listen to us because you know I've I've been up against <laughs> USA wrestling and you know everywhere else you know about racism. They're not going to listen to you until you have a group. I I've, I've been squashed. I won a few, but usually you get squashed. I've talked to over a hundred people. You all, we all have the same story. I have to stop people. Hold on, I don't need to call anybody. I don't need to verify anything. Your story is my story. My story is your story. It's the same story. The only thing we do is we talk about it in little pockets and we also, we stay in, we work in silos. African-Americans are one, one thing they're good at. They're good at, working in silos instead of a group. So when you come to them as an individual, I'm talking to make a demand, it's only one person. And anybody knows that if you're, if, 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 if there's something that you want to do to, to, and that's what they did to, to Bobby, separate him from a group, isolate him. It's only him. He's the, he's the racist. So what I'm saying is that the, the, the power is in the collection of, of thoughts because you're not newsworthy when it comes to, well, you said that they're racist. You're just a long, long, you're just a one person saying that they're racist. A group, a, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you're fine. I'm just, that was good stuff, Coach. I, I definitely appreciate that. It was, uh, it was it's deep. It was deep. I'm going to get, uh, is Pendleton still on? I know he said he had to go real quick. I want to... Yeah, I got a couple minutes. Yeah, yeah, you go ahead. Uh, just have your input on that, and I'll, I'll let you go. Then we'll switch over to Maple. <laughs> well, I was uh, Jamil was texting me. He's uh, he's yeah. unfortunate Sad that he couldn't get on the call. I just told me uh, like he just got he just got brought up. Uh, uh, he made twice as much as Nate Angle at Stanford. So okay, and then All right. <laughs> when he was brought to Asia, he made more than Lee Fritz. Uh, so there's a lot of misconceptions that get flown out, floated out there, and well, that's good to know. <laughs> um, and he, even at ASU, you look at one of the things I was extremely proud to, uh, to work there was five out of six of the senior athletic directors were African American. Five out of six, and they hired Zeke. You know, there's a there there's a lot of um, it's just a really tough time in the world right now. Um, I just knowing talking to guys like Coleman Scott and. I, I think I had a little bit of a, un, a unique experience. My freshman year of college, five out of 10 starters at Oklahoma State were African-American. I had Daniel Cormier, Reggie Wright, uh, Tyrone Lewis, Mola Wall. I mean, it was just a little bit of a different of an environment. And I can't remember her name, but she was asking about um, putting your son in that environment. Um, stats don't lie, numbers don't lie. Um, do your research. There's a lot of schools that are uh, predominantly more inclusive. And I think what Angel was saying on having a culture of inclusion cuts a lot of different ways. Um, I do have four African-Americans on my team right now that are struggling that I have to talk to 
once a week, once a day to give them some kind of guidance. And one of the things that I've been preaching to them in our room is I, I just want a culture of inclusion. I want women wrestlers. I want men wrestlers. I want African-American, black, Hispanic, anybody just to come in and do our sport. Um, I think a lot of people right now are looking for avenues to help, to, to affect change. I know like what Nate Jackson is doing and, and a lot of these younger guys are inspiring me every single day. And I didn't even realize it when I became a, a head coach that, um, that I was one out of three. I, I didn't realize it until I was on um, uh, the Zoom call that Kyvin and Nate had set up. And I was kind of listening to some of those stories and I realized I do have a responsibility to guys like Mark Hall and Daryl Thomas and some people that are, younger than me that, you know, obviously I, I was not too thrilled that my contract kind of details came out there, but I've had a lot of, a lot of jealousy and a lot of them, some things yeah. said to me. Yeah. Whether I saw the comments on enough. Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My mom put it out there, I would not have, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, but it gives people opportunities. I know I'm working with Anthony Holman at the NCA and the, and, and the PAC 12, uh, my boss, Scott Barnes here at Oregon state, you know, he sat me down and he was like one of the things that he didn't really uh, he says he didn't but i believe him is i'm the only african-american head coach at oregon state and they've asked questions on how can they affect change how can they go um a lot of the stats that got brought up unfortunately are true and unfortunately aren't just wrestling the rooney rule is one of the wor not worst rules but one of the most painful rules in athletics that for the NFL, they have to, they are required to interview head coaches and GMs, uh, a certain amount of African American head coaches and GMs. I mean, that's heartbreaking that it has to be a rule in place, but this isn't something that's just strictly towards wrestling. It's not. You look at the numbers across the board, it is across all sports. Um, and how, what are we going to do to affect it? That's what I really just love listening to Nate and some of you guys talk is they're going out there trying to not just complain, but to actually implement change. And uh, one of the things I've talked with the PAC 12 about is doing some kind of scholarship, incentivizing young men to go into administration and to go into coaching. It really is. Even when I was going through my process, I, I heard uh, of, of, of taking my time when I got hired. Um, you know, one of the things I, I heard uh, Glenn talking about was finding people that you could trust. And I'm ashamed to say it, but I didn't ever even really consider just black, white, whoever. I, I was more looking at recruiting demographics, playing off my strengths, people that I could trust. I never even thought about, should I be hiring an all black staff or should I be making sure that my staff is, you know, diverse, which I believe I do have a diverse staff. Isaiah is, uh, Martinez is um uh, Hispanic, uh, Mike Kasoy and uh, Nate Engel are, are Jewish. And I was I kind of like looked at them the other day. I was like, oh, we actually do have pretty good uh, diversity. So, you know, it just never was something in my mind. And uh, it's something that I'm going to have to keep thinking about. Um, you know, it's been the hardest start to a, a head coaching career of all time. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty certain that no one has ever started a head coaching career in the middle of a pandemic, uh, everything that's going on, uh, just the turbulence of the world, uh, uncertainty, just that we're going to have a season. And on top of that, you know, if you had asked me in January what I was going to be doing, I thought I was going to be selling medical device sales um, in Scottsdale. I had actually told my administration that this would, that last year would be my final year at ASU. I was not returning uh, regardless. And I had started making plans and, you know, God kind of turned my life upside down. And I really feel like he put me in this position for a reason. And I'm incredibly excited about the opportunity. And it's just one of the things now that I know that there's just so much more layers to it and so much more things that I, I have a responsibility to do. I and mean, having Matea, I mean, I had, I was up to about three in the morning um, a couple of weeks ago because uh, um, Adam Ratab, Mateo Olmos, and Devin Turner were uh, helping organize the protests in um, Eugene. Uh, and that was right after I had just been in Scottsdale a couple of days ago and saw the looting and the rioting. And now when I flew back, I was like, my athletes are there. And 
I had that internal fight where as a coach, you just worry about your athletes health and safety first and foremost, but then how am I helping them grow as men? So I had to call them and tell them I support you guys. I just ask that they just do, just keep in mind to be safe. And that's all I could do. And, you know, I called my administration and I was very happy how my administrators handled it. They said, absolutely, you let us know what we can do. Um, Mateo and Adam and Devin, um, are, they're, they're actually, they were contacted by the NWACP and they're gonna be going to Washington in the fall to kind of participate in some, some groups out there. And I couldn't be more proud of them as human beings and men first. So, um, sorry, I, I uh, got you're a little fine. long. <laughs> Appreciate it, coach. Uh, we're gonna have to, Move on and move on. Maple, he has uh, some time. Thank you, Coach Pendleton. I know you got to jump off. Uh, appreciate it. That was very good, helpful insight there. So, Coach Maple, you on? Yes, sir. What's going on? Not too much. Uh, so, what, what do you think about the conversation that's been going on so far? Man, I think it's important. I guess um, it's something I want to be a part of more. It's something we're getting I'm white. Over. Over. What's, what's that? Hold on. So, Hill, yeah. make sure you meet the people coming on, Hill. But I'm just learning more. Uh, this is something that I, I need, and I think we need, you know, to meet, meet more as African Americans. And um, man, I'm just excited to be a part of it. All right. So uh, now, what's some of the things that you think Missouri or you as a coaching staff, you know, been going on, been doing with the the guys on the team at this time with everything that's going on? Yeah, I think, man, honestly, through this whole thing, I, I've brought I've grown a new you know, I guess, perspective on coaching and even for Brian Smith. Um, I found out how much he truly cares about his athletes. Um, you know, I've had him call me and I'm sure Dom oh, as well, he's on here, has had him call him and he's not in tears, but he's emotional, like uh, through this whole process, like he is so concerned about how he can do better to make it so there's not these inequalities or even these predispositions. And, um, he wants our team to grow. He wants our team to be better. And um, we've talked about it on every Zoom call. We've had a, a talk about it. He's assigning books, telling him to watch movies based off of all the divide that's going on. Um, and that's been important to me. We were having a conversation with our team and it was sad because it shocked me that, you know, a white male in leadership was saying the word black to, to a group of people. Like he was sitting there, you know, giving you know, talking about his thoughts and saying, you know, that he was that even talking about it, it was kind of shocking to me. And I was, it, it was a sad thing because that's what we need to grow, I think. Um, so as a, as a team, we've been talking about it and having fun. And like uh, Smith had me and Dom share our experiences with the team because that, that helps change too, because these guys need to know what our experience is. Dom sh uh, shared some things that happened to him even in college at Mizzou. Uh, I share things like, you know, my not meeting my grandparents till I was a lot later because they wouldn't accept my dad. You know, my mom's white, my dad's black. And, um, you know, I think it, it's, it's making an impact on our team and how we view each other. Nice. So, you know, with your, your background of course, being around everybody, has that been able to help you become a better coach and, and dealing with everybody as far as, you know, who they are and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think... You know, that's one thing I've learned throughout the years, like early on in my career, you know, it, it, to talk about the real stuff is uncomfortable. You know, people, people want to try to fit in. You know, we talk about administrators not hiring, you know, black coaches. Well, you know, when you're looking to hire something, you want to hire something that you've seen be successful in the past. And all they've seen throughout history is these white coaches who look this way, dress this way, talk this way. And so it's uncomfortable for them to, see a black coach come in and so it's harder for them I think and that that's no excuse and so it's been hard like early on in my career I, I look back now I wanted to to fit in and I didn't want to create those waves you know I wanted to I didn't want to recruit and talk about you know to recruiting black kids I didn't I didn't want to talk about race because I didn't want to overstep and be not politically correct I didn't uh you know talking to guys on the team I didn't want to speak about you know the different different struggles because I didn't want my white athletes thinking I was playing favoritism and so things that I've learned now is like 
man, you got to talk about it. The, the position I am is a platform. And so like when I do recruit black athletes now, I do talk about it. I mean, we do talk about, I do tell them that, Hey man, I had these experiences in college. Um, I had these struggles, these struggles with refs, with fans, you know, calling you this name, everything in the book. And, you know, we do have Don Bradley here who, who had these experiences. And so I think that's an important thing. And then the young recruits, uh, they need to know that they need to know that, you know, there will be struggles. You will be treated differently and there, but there's people here to help. Um, and for the guys on the team, I uh, like being scared that I'll be showing favoritism and, you know, I kind of had a change in perspective. It's really not favoritism. It's every kid's different. Just like we don't, we can't coach everybody the same. You know, this kid adds to different needs than this kid. Uh, when I go and I talk about, you know, the struggles of a black athlete to my black athletes, I'm not showing favoritism. I'm showing a different approach that his needs need. I mean, he has different needs than, than you do. Um, and that's how I've grown, I think, and I'm trying to get better. I'm trying to learn more and um, I reach out. And, you know, for me, I think the representation is huge. Um, and like Mr. Coyle was saying, you know, the voice. Uh, for me, I'm always someone who, I don't really like social media. I keep my inner circle small. Um, and I try to stay away from the social media thing and all that, but the voice is important uh, because it needs to be said just because, you know, I made it through and I'm a coach, you know, the, that path isn't paved wide enough yet. And so we need to keep creating that, that uh, awareness. All right. Two things I'm going to run by. I know you said dress too. I think, uh, I think as coaches, I know myself as having mentors around, you know, I, I finally got to the point where, you know, I was like, Hey, what? I'm gonna let my hair grow out. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a not wear the Levi jeans and the collar shirt. You know, I'm, I'm going to wear my sweatpants and what I want to wear. If I wear a gold chain, I'm going to wear it just because that's what I like. And I'm not going to do it because I want to fit in anymore. I didn't care about fitting in anymore. So it's interesting that you said that. Secondly, I didn't know you probably weren't aware of this, but in our generation in Missouri, it was always told for black athletes to never go to Missouri. So, I mean, I mean, Missouri has gone through like a little phase a few years ago yeah. of where they had some racial stuff on the campus. How has the campus been since then? I know you went around for it, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> you kind of just got there, but I can't think speak about that? to the, the past. I think Dom, he's been around a lot longer than me. I've only been right. here, here, but I know where we're at currently. I know we have a lot of black athletes on the team and I know that it's something that's important to me, important to Dom and even to coach Smith. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons, you know, I've had different, different staffs or different coaches in the past where I've had these arguments where there is that, you know, that bias, that uh, those stereotypes where we've had, you know, this white athlete and this black athlete with the same credentials. And I have a coach arguing saying, well, and he hasn't watched film on either of them. And all of a sudden he's arguing that this kid, you know, he's tough. This white kid's tough. He doesn't say white kid, but he's, he's a lot tougher. We know where we're going to get from him. He's going to be working hard. Uh, this, this black athlete, we, we don't know. He may be soft. He may gas out. And, you know, that's important for me to, like, I was livid discussing, having that discussion to, because I was like, how do you know you've never watched film? You know, and it's something where we got to have that voice. And that's one thing, you know, Coach Smith has been awesome with. He's very, very open with our talks. And, you know, he, he has never done anything like that because he, he just thinks we're going to put the best athlete out there. And so um, it's important that you surround yourself with people that are, you know, I guess accepting and, and know and, and speak up when it's not. But it, it's funny. I know one of my good friends, Carl Reed, I'm going to mention him. He's a high school coach here at Luther North, and he's been putting the college coaches who are not stepping up and talking for their black athletes on blast. And he's one of the best programs in Missouri. He's like, I'm not sending my kids to coaches who can't speak up now in this situation. Yeah. So, and I know you're talking about coaches who have said type of stuff like that for the schools you have been at. So is that something that you think people deal with as far as being recruited a lot when coaches may say that stuff? I know it goes on behind doors. <laughs> you know, you're never going to see it in the mainstream. And that's why, like I said, it's, it's uncomfortable to talk about, but you're never going to hear that. But I think there's a lot of decisions decided recruiting wise based off of the skin color, you know, and it's not, and I think it's a lot of it's subconscious, you know, subconsciously, 
you know, some coaches make these decisions because this is what they've seen in the past from, this is their predisposed opinions. And so like, I, I know for me, if I hear it, like it's a, it's a point to me to make, make like, let's, let's, let's talk about it. Let's d dive into it and find out why. So, um, and you know, I, I, my heart's out for, you know, mom's like Tina, she mentioned, you know, her son was uh, concerned about it and it, he should be. And I think, um, you know, hopefully we can make a change. So it's not that way. Do oh, you have any questions? Wait, uh, Coach Ford, you no, got something? I'll just go real quick. Uh, you know, just, just to insert, you know, you got to also know, know the history. I mean, I grew up in a time, I'm going to probably telegraph my, my age, uh, where, you know, most white people told, told, told us that we couldn't, we couldn't run long distance. It was just, it was, it was, just a matter of fact, and they, and they 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 gave all kind of scientific reasons for it, which are which were totally false. But it was based on racism. It was based on racism. So a lot of that is coming is is it is rooted in that kind of thinking, you know. Um, and 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 you know you're obviously you know way younger, but you know perhaps the older generation. And I know that I grew up in that era where we were told we couldn't um, uh, run long distance to a fact that I made all my children run long distance and they were the best at it. So it's one of those things that you gotta, I mean, you, you gotta talk about it. You gotta say it the way it is. I mean, obviously it doesn't, it doesn't you know, make anybody feel good to, to uh, uh, say something that's uncomfortable. However, what's uncomfortable is needed to be said so that we can lay it on the table, show it for what it is. Because when you hide it, that's when it's festered. And that's when it gets ugly and that's what happens. The more communication, I mean, you're right on, uh, Maple, the more communication you can have, the better. Because it, it, it dispels all the myths and all the, you know, un, the uneasy feeling because it's out there. The truth, you know, as they say, will set you free. Appreciate it. Maple, anything you got to say? I know you said you, you had a short time here, so just wanted to make sure you, you get your turn. Anything else you want to ask or input? No, I, I appreciate you having me on, and, you know, I definitely appreciate all you guys showing up. I'd like to get involved more, so, you know, if I know you can get – you got Cornell's number, so reach out to him. <laughs> find yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the network guy right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's cool. Appreciate it. Uh, also, I want to thank well, – before we get to Nate, I kind of saved him for last. I, I knew he was going to talk about the Black Wrestling Coach Associations. Uh, Jonathan, thanks for letting us have his platform. And actually, I can't can't lie, this was Jonathan's idea. So Jonathan definitely brought this to my attention. Uh, he runs MissouriWrestling.com. So thank you, Jonathan. Uh, also, I want to thank my right hand man, Jay Hill, for being on the call. All right, and uh, my assistant coach who never comes on, but I got to get him on more. Dennis Cocker, Cocker, show something so they can show your face since you never get to come on as much. Dennis. Where yeah, I'm here. What's going on, everybody? Yeah, I just want everybody to see your face. There he is. So that's, that's my other coach who's always helping out. So appreciate it, DK, for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> so, cool, cool. All right. Anything you want to say before we jump to Nate Jackson? Um, like, I, I was going to share my story uh, with wrestling college. So what, um, what I realized was a lot of these um, coaches, I guess um, whenever they try to recruit a black kid, they don't reach out to another black kid trying to recruit them. So I think it's important for these coaches to um, educate themselves on like all kind of kids who are diverse so that they, they can um, re relate to those kids a little bit. You know, just because um, you have a black kid on your team and you want to get a, another black kid, that's a go-to move. Then my oh, boy, you black, so maybe we can um, re re reach out to this kid and um, recruit them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So definitely a good point. So yeah, yeah. All right, Coach Jackson, are you ready? You already kind of schooled us a little bit on the BWA and, and everything, so that's kind of why I put you last, to make sure you can tell everybody what's going on. But what is your input so far with everything that you've been listening to? Um, so far, so good. I mean, I think that these conversations are necessary. I think um, among us, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. It's pretty comfortable. Um, when we talk to our, our white counterparts, um, it's uncomfortable, you know? But uh, we got to remember why we're, we have those conversations. Um, it's because we, we're living in really uncomfortable um, circumstances right now where people are literally dying, you know. Uh, someone was talking about looting and burning buildings. 
um, you know, I think that's a symptom of, of, of racism and years and time and time again of the same thing. Um, our contract being voided. Um, when we, when we are, are honorable members of society, um, when we, we hold ourselves to a higher standard, we, we uh, hold ourselves accountable. Um, and this same thing can happen to us. Like, um, what, what, what does it matter? Like, you know, people are literally losing their minds right now. So I sit in my position right now and I'm pretty comfortable. Um, you know, I, I have some, some area where my kids can play. I'm kind of removed from a lot of stuff. Um, but I know that I have to have those same conversations that are uncomfortable with my son about, you know, what, what, what's expected of him when he gets older, how he should behave um, around other people and all this stuff. And it's like, dude, why, why should I have to tell somebody, you know, why should I have to explain that to him? Right. Um, my story, you know, I, I've dealt with overt racism my whole life. You know, that's just, that's just being a black person in America. You know, um, I think that a thing that really changed me. Um, so when I was eight years old, my dad talked to me about what the world was and what it wasn't. And it kind of turned my, my life upside down a little bit. Um, I was a really smart kid and I, a lot of my brain energy went to being a biologist and uh, studying animals and all the, the normal stuff that kids like. And then when I learned about some of the things, I, I really kind of obsessed over it. Um, and I went into a dark place and I was, you know, really <laughs> anti, anti people. You know, I didn't, I didn't like a lot of different people. Um, but until I established pride within myself, you know, I felt like that was really important. When I got to college, um, that was the first time that I really started to uh, be in different groups, you know, and, and even, so I went to a, 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 a private high school and, you know, it was a Catholic school, a lot of white kids, but I found my group within, you know, I, I hung with my people, basically. Um, when I got into college, um, I started to be a lot more trusting um, of different people. Um, but then, you know, so the way I got to college is kind of a, a weird story um, where, I, so I actually had a kid right out of high school, uh, me and my wife and um, my girlfriend at the time. So I didn't start school right away. I started in the second semester. Um, so as I got on the team right away, I'm this guy who um, transferred from a JUCO, all this stuff. You know, it's like, whoa, what? Like, how did this, how did this become my narrative, you know? Um, you start to um, change your narrative and what you do. You know, I'm a person who worked really hard, um, held other people accountable. I wanted to be a leader right away. I was a captain for three years. But you notice the space, you know, between the people. Um, people just don't understand. And they're uncomfortable when they try to understand. And sometimes, you know, as a black person, you don't, you don't want to have to explain yourself every day, you know. Um, I confided in my coach, you know, and, and my coach was a good coach. He, he coached Angel, and um, I don't want to talk bad about him, but I think one thing that happened and, and kind of changed my course of even why I'm here now um, is because my senior year, when I graduated, you know, I was a multiple-time All-American, and it was supposed to be this great thing, uh, the send-off at the banquet. Um, and it turned into a selling point for the coach. You know, he, he was talking about how, you know, I, 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 I kid you not, he, he said how when I first was coming in, uh, him and the counselor, like, made a bet to see if I was going to graduate because I had a kid. I ended up having three kids in college. I have four kids now. Um, you know, um, and for me, like, it was like, wow, like, to him, you know, he, he said that I wouldn't have went to college, you know, if, if it wasn't for all this stuff. And it's like, man, I've been planning on going to college my whole life. So it was, it was a lot of really weird um, things that kind of were uncovered. And I realized that the guy as a person isn't a bad person. And we connected really, you know, throughout my, my career. But the disconnect or the, the tokenism, you know, he was like, man, you were like a really good, like all, this, all these things that he was reinforcing, um, it came from his, his ignorance. Um, and I knew for myself, like, you know, I thought I was going to be there coaching right after. Um, I had actually talked to him about it, and we had, like, contract drafted and all type of stuff. Um, but I knew that I had to get away from that situation because I knew that, um, in that in that situation, I couldn't be taken the way that I wanted to be taken. I couldn't control, um, you know, my story anymore because he had told my story to all these people. Um, so um, I, ended up, I ended up taking a, a chance on myself, moved across, across the country, um, got offered an opportunity to, to coach at Princeton. Um, and it's been a really, really great, uh, awesome experience. Um, in, in the contract ne negotiation, you know, I, I realized that I'm the, the third assistant, right? Um, volunteer assistant is what it's called. Um, but 
even in that, I, I asked to not be called volunteer assistant. Um, I asked that my title is assistant coach um, because as an, as a coach, you know, I want to be on the same, I want to be on the same level as my peers. I want my input to be felt um, the same to the same degree. Um, that was something that was really important to me, um, especially branching out and not staying under uh, the previous coach. So when I got that opportunity, you know, like to have my voice heard and felt, um, it meant a lot. And I think that my relationship with those guys now um, has only grown. I've been there for going on four years now. And, you know, it, it, it allows me to be able to pursue things like creating Black Wrestler Association. Um, you know, right now I created the, the LLC is done. Um, we're, we're, we apply for 501c3 status, which is going to take a little bit, um, but we'll be a nonprofit. I mean, and people can, can write it off on their taxes and it'll be really good. Um, there's a lot of brothers that um, <laughs> I just talked to and confided in. Um, the Jordan Burroughs is of the world, the, the Kenny Mondays of the world, and so on and so forth um, that want this and they understand the, the importance of, of this. Um, and their voices are unique, you know, but our, our sentiment is the same. We feel the same. Um, and even in doing this, I kind of realized that I had to branch out still, you know. Um, I had to have com conversations with, with uh, women wrestlers, um, black women wrestlers, because we share a lot of the similar experience, but there are things that, that they deal with that I can't understand. And if this is supposed to move the way it's supposed to, um, or that it's, that the mission statement uh, claims it's supposed to, um, we need everybody to be involved with it. Um, I had to reach out to the Greco team and, and talk to those guys because I just talked to the people that are immediately close to me. Um, and I think in doing this, like we can really just create something as a community um, that, that is going to, it's going to be here long before, like, I don't have to be the person who runs the ship. You know, I can step down right now. And I, I'm confident that the people who have, have created it will make sure that it's seen through because it's that important. Um, it's, it's a no brainer. Um, it's called a BW association. Uh, it's on Twitter. It's on Facebook. It's on Instagram. Um, check it out and just kind of stay up to date. Um, obviously right now we're still building our infrastructure. We just kind of laid out our organizational structure um, we're, we're getting into strategic planning process um, just to figure out how we can do real things um, and the best way to do them to, to really impact the most people. Um, and, and the real is like, we just need everybody. So um, all the people on this call, like let's figure out how to stay connected. Um, so, so I can give you this link um, so I can have the contact information because when I need it, like, and I need people, you know, um, I think that's, what's going to be the most valuable. Um, it's, it's something that's national um, and it's something that, you know, everybody can have a part in. Um, and I'm not doing this for anything else. You know, like <laughs> I was planning a wedding. So me and my wife have been married for seven years, but we never had a wedding because of, you know, life, life, life throws. Um, and, you know, I have three daughters. So I want, I, I know that they deserve to be treated like princesses and my wife deserves no less. Um, and, and I'm going to have a big party next year. This is what I was planning. Um, and then, and then um, George Floyd was murdered, you know? So, um, that's still a thing we still got to do that wedding, but it's, it's really important things that, um, you know, we need to get into and we have to remove ourselves from our own life and our own comfort, you know? So yeah, that's, that's it. I really appreciate this, this, uh, platform, man. It's, it's awesome just to be a sounding, a sounding board here, um, and see so many familiar faces. Um, I want to stay connected, um, questions right. and things like that. I'm open to. I have a question for you. A young man text me here. He said, as a, uh, white coach with a white culture style, how would we reach out to kids and get more African-American kids to wrestle? And what's the best way they can do that? Um, it's really about learning. Um, you, you really have to understand um, some of the, some of the, the microaggressions that um, a, kid, a kid feels um, from us knowingly and unknowingly. Um, I come from a place of privilege where I don't understand every kid that I come in contact with. Um, but, um, you, you, I think a thing that we, we think we hear, we hear learning, right? And we think, okay, I need to ask this kid. Um, that, you got to be careful with that too, because that kid only represents his life. Um, what you have to do, really, is you have to, to, to show yourself approved, which is in the Bible, you know. Uh, go, go study and show yourself approved. Uh, read material. Um, try to, you know, there's so many things out there to watch um, that you can learn so much about um, how, how, what is happening to people, how they relate to it, how they react to it, how they respond to it, and what they expect. Um, and that's really it. You just have to, to be diligent. Um, I, can, I can speak to my experience um, and what I would want as a kid, but that's, that's not really going to serve anybody because 
I'm still looking for those things myself to relate to everybody. It's, it's a lot of people. Um, I hate, I hate, like, I just want to start calling stuff out. Um, I think that our voice has been silenced and um, pacified for so long where we, we are taught to come a certain way. And if we're not coming that way, then what we have to say is, is negligible. Right. Um, you know, I had people say, man, why are you in your Sunday's best to, to go see a house? You know, when I was in college, first of all, Sunday's best comes from a, uh, that's a, a slave term. You know, uh, people wore their Sunday's best when, when they were, uh, shown, uh, with other, other slave traders and whatnot, you know, um, which is, which is super offensive, but people don't know the ignorance in that. Uh, but at the same time, like we have to understand that in order for us to make these jumps, we have to just call things like they, like we see them. Um, and not, and not coddle, coddle people and sugarcoat things for people. Um, as long as our intention is, is in the right place, like I think it should be well received. Um, and there's so many, it's so much information out there. Like myself, like since, since I've been kind of embarking on this journey, I've been learning so much. So um, we have to challenge ourselves and not, and not really lean on a kid because a kid is a kid. Um, and, and what they're dealing with is unique to them. Um, and, 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 and who the hell do you think you are to, to try to prod them to give you an answer, to answer to all these kids now? Um, if you ask this one kid and then you ask another kid and then you ask another kid and you're doing that, that's a little bit different. But man, it's, 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 a, it's so much information out there and we, we have to take advantage of that. So let me ask you this, Coach Jackson. What is like Princeton doing to complete the diversity of, of the wrestling team and maybe the campus as a whole? Um, Princeton is actually a really diverse area. They have a lot of um, international students. I think they make up more than, than the white population within the school, which is, which is really cool. Um, and it, it kind of breeds a, a, the, the area surrounding is, is pretty diverse. Um, but <laughs> diversity isn't, isn't black either. So, <laughs> you know, like, uh, these same people that, that are diverse and, and you know, well-meaning, they don't understand our experience either. Um, and a lot of black people don't understand black, other black people's experience um, because that may not be their experience as well. So, um, you know, me, I, I grew up in one of the poorest places in the, in the country um, at, at one time. And I had all these different walks of life. Um, I've been blessed to have both parents um, take care of me. Um, I think we have to be careful of, of labeling people as underprivileged and all this stuff because that's not everybody's experience but the racism and the effects of racism and the the institutions that permeate and, and continue to circulate these these this, these racist ideologies um they exist and they have always existed and they're not going anywhere until we we address those things uh, we can we can look at like like i said before like we can look at people burning that stuff down and being destructive and all that or we can look at the root of why they are doing these things. Why, why are people feeling like they, they have no way else to deal with this, you know? Um, yeah, that's, that's, really, that's really all I got. Oh, I appreciate it, Coach Jackson. Uh, so now we're gonna have a, like an open discussion. If anybody have a question, uh, you can ask. We'll start with Coach Jackson since he's still one of the last ones. So if you have a question now, you may ask it. Coach Doolin, you got something? Yeah, hit your mic on, Coach. Um, you know what? I'm just happy to be on this conversation right now. Um, something that I was said earlier, I hate to go back to this, but I, uh, I forgot the, uh, uh, the lady's name who was talking earlier about her son being recruited. Coach Lillard, uh, Miss Tina Lillard. Yeah. Yes, Tina. Um, you know, me and my son had those same conversations. Uh, he's a kid that's being, you know, being looked at by some schools right now. And I tell him, don't look at the school. Talk to the coaching staff. You know, one of the questions I ask him to, you know, you know, talk to the coaches about, ask them how long they plan on being on staff there. You know, you know, once they get the next, next big job offer, are they leaving? You know, you know, have those kind of conversations, you know, with, you know, with coaches. Um, other than that, you know, Missouri, um, there's not a lot of black coaches in Missouri. So um, there's been some challenges with that. I, 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 froze I, on. That, are, that are black. <laughs> you froze on this coach in the middle of your question. I didn't hear you. Uh, um, in the state of Missouri, what's there, four or five? Five. Uh, five. Five black head coaches. And so, you know, I've been blessed to, you know, be in this sport a long time and, you know, see a lot of different things, but there needs to be some changes in Missouri as, as far as how, you know, you know things are done and, 
you know, you know, things are processed. It's it's still that that whole concept of this way it's been done, so it's where we're gonna keep doing it. And so that's that that old mindset's gotta change. But you know, like I said, I'm just happy to be on this phone call and you know, hearing hearing all the different coaches, uh, you know, you know, you know, stories and um but I, but but I, but I truly believe there's there's there needs to be more more black head coaches. There there's be, there needs to be more black men in um places of um principals, administrations. Um I'd love to see more black coaches at the D one and D two level. Um but that's all I got right now. Like I like to say I'm just happy to be on this call. Appreciate it. Hey, I have a question for Coach Foy and Coach Jackson. Uh, so how one do we get involved with with the associations and like what's the cost we need to put down to be a member? You wanna go? Um, so so I'm we're determining that probably this Friday we'll probably have a really good idea on what we're gonna do with that. Um, I haven't talked to Coach Foy uh, specifically about doing this dual membership, um, but that's gonna be kind of negotiated with us. Um, but I feel pretty good. About, I mean, I think um, it's, it's going to be about what we can do um, within that, that cost, uh, what programs we can implement um, within that cost. So that's, um, that's all I got. I don't know if Coach has it. Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, like I said, we, 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 we were uh, kind of um, started before, before Nate um, and, and his group. Uh, so we, we, we have the infrastructure uh, put together. Uh, to be a uh, founding member, we're closing out. We got about 30 more sp spots for a founding member. Founding members are $24 a month for a 12 month period. Uh, after that, you're, it's a lifetime membership. Uh, uh, what, we're, what, what you get from that is an opportunity to build something that's historic. You know, what, uh, the, you know the Hall of Fame is kind of uh, uniquely positioned. It is, it is pretty much in retrospect, is, is going to take people who have done uh, tr tremendous things in wrestling, promote them, uh, uplift them, uh, put them in the Hall of Fame so that people, uh, young people can be uh, inspired. So the biggest thing is uh, we have a website. It's uh, NAHOF. It's, it's, it's the acronym for the National African American Wrestling Hall of Fame, N-A-A-W-H-O-F, uh, dot org. It is a 501 uh, designated um, organization. Uh, anything that you, uh, your membership is tax deductible, as well as any contributions you may give. Um, the biggest thing, like I said, with the NAHOF is, it, it's pretty much uh, kind of answering a lot of what uh, questions that was uh, asked here. And that is, you know, we're, we're taking control of, of actually partnering up with USA Wrestling, uh, NCAA without even their permission, because we're growing the sport of wrestling. We're going to bring in those uh, um, those wrestlers who have not, you know, uh, considered wrestling. We're going to bring them in early. We're going to make a conscious effort to go and recruit them, and recruit and educate the family so that they understand the vehicles that are available for them uh, to be successful in this great sport. So that to, to answer your question, www. Uh, Nahoff, N-A-A-W-H-O-F dot org. And I put it in, in the chat as well. Yeah, we saw it in the chat. So 24, appreciate 24 that. a month, we'll, we'll, get, we'll basically uh, secure your, your, <laughs> your, your name in history as a founding member of this, this great organization. That's pretty cool. Anybody else have another question? I do have one. I, I'm holding on to it if anybody has any questions for anybody. I know we've been on here for a while. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask a question. Yeah, uh, go ahead. So, uh, this goes out to everybody. Um, I think the story of race in all sports has been going on for a long time. Um, we, we're at a you know, difficult time because of everything that's going on. So when it comes to ourselves, what are what are we going to deem as limitations to further ourselves, African Americans, Black uh, wrestlers and coaches, without feeling like the powers that be um, are going to give us a difficult time? 
because we're being ourselves. And I'm asking this question because Cornell will probably agree. We came up in an era and in an area where we were allowed to be ourselves, have our swag, actually enjoy the sport of wrestling the way we wanted to. I know I was uh, very happy to be around the Harvey Twisters uh, and also the Omaha Explorators back in the day. They were allowed to be themselves. They were allowed to go out there and do things um, their way. Um, but, you know, I think that some of what's been going on in wrestling is because there are a lot of silent voices. There are a lot of people that choose not to speak out, whether it be for the financial side or whether it just it's just not to be a problem. So I just want some thoughts on that. Um, so, so I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I think that that's a really good point, right? Um, so I've been, we've been approached already and had uh, talks with uh, NCA wrestling. Um, we've had talks with USA wrestling. We've had talks with NWCA, which is national wrestling coaches, Hall of Fame, uh, national wrestling coaches association. Um, and they, you know, we got approached by Beat the Streets National. Um, and the, the theme is they all, you know, it sounds really good. They all want to buy us, basically, because they understand that this is a need and this is something that we're going to pursue. And they don't want us to become a threat, right? Um, so I think maintaining our autonomy, um, being able to say, sure, we could be a partner. We, we can partner with you, um, whatever. Not letting them control the narrative really because it, it, it goes back to, Hey, I'm, I'll give you $60,000. Um, and then you just, you know, whatever. And then, Oh, Oh, you're not doing what I want you to do. I'll take that $60,000 back. You know? Um, so I think that it's all about us being together um, and being able to withstand organic, organic growth. Um, I think that this is something that across the board, um, black kids, I, I've been kind of impressed and, and surprised by the, the black, the young black kids that have reached out about this, you know? Um, I think that, you know, leadership, leadership is, is, is something that they recognize within themselves and they recognize that they need, you know, in order to keep going. Um, so I, I don't know. I think, I think if we continue to do what I, what I kind of plan for this to do, it can be something that pushes up and pushes back against um, some of those institutions that be that are big, big, you know, bullies and, and, and threatening and, you know, they might do whatever, but if we can stand together on this, um, the black community and our allies, because there's a lot of people who want this to work that have no, they're not black guys, you know? Um, so I think that this, this is the solution. Nice. I appreciate that. Go ahead, coach. Four. I don't, no, I was just going to uh, add on to that. It, it is, it is, you know, for us, like I said, it's, it's a, you know, I, I call it good, good cop, bad cop, uh, in a sense, because we're, we're, like I said, we do things after the fact. You, you know, you've already uh, did what you, you did. We, we, we highlight you. We're, we're, you know, kind of um, uh, subtly saying, hey, you know, let's do the right thing. But if you don't, if you're not doing the right thing, we're going we're gonna to highlight these kids and we're going to give them their due uh, recognition and all those things. And we're going to uh, hopefully uh inspire uh, more wrestlers to come into wrestling how do we change it and this is just my my um, strategy um, i should say know how strategy is is to to do our part and what i'm saying by that we're about seven percent of uh african-american wrestlers are about seven percent of the population um but we 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 we, we hold about 30 to 28 to 30 percent of the uh, positions uh, at, at the top level. So what we're doing is, uh, again, doing the same thing that the NBA did, the, uh, the NFL did. And what they did, they, they had more individuals in the sport. Being, you know, instead of, instead of uh, the football player who, who uh, just only plays football or you know, he, he actually started playing football and he's, we're, we're gonna recruit those football uh, players into into wrestlers early on and then we're going to increase we're going to increase the number of the population thus increasing the number of uh, participation and of course taking those uh, uh, positions at the higher level that will then also uh, uh, give a demand of 
of, of uh, having more cultures involved because most of those co cultures are coming from uh, the, the league or the, the sports, uh, what is it, the uh, club uh, level. So they will be pushed up into the coaching ranks. We also have a dual um, focus in bringing in more officials because we, as we know, there's three, three individuals on the mat at all times. And here's, here's the thing. I mean, it's not, not nothing new about having majority rules. Well, the reason why, you know, the, we have a small voice is one, we never come together. Two, uh, we, we're, we're, we're basically the mi minority in, in, in the sport. So my whole thing is, well, why not take an active role in increasing that number, thus increasing your, your say, thus increasing your, you know, everything that's in, your involvement in wrestling, and then that will, that will in, and of, in and of itself, uh, create change from the bottom up. All right, so I'm gonna go uh, uh, right. real quick. Uh, yeah, um, Mr. Uh, I have a question. Oh uh, yeah, Coach Douglas, go ahead. I know he's still on. <laughs> yeah, um, Mike, you might know more about this. USA Wrestling is getting ready to um, print their uh, cards. They're ca uh, cards that uh, you have to have to compete. Membership cards, yeah. Membership cards. Uh, I, I don't, I don't see any competition this year. Uh, and uh, if you're going to buy the card, if you have to buy the card, what are you getting for it? That, that's a question for for the group, I guess. I, 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 I don't, I don't see how they're going to be able to compete. There's not going to be any tournaments. So what do you need the card for? Is that about USA card? Is that what he's talking about? Yeah, yes. the USA wrestling card. Uh, and, and the question is, is um, you know, how are you going to get the value of the USA wrestling card if there's no activities? Um, I think uh, well, a lot of coaches need, need that card for uh, insurance. Insurance. Yep. So that, that's, a, that's their big sell um, where they have a you can't you can't even wrestle in the wrestling club if you don't have this insurance. Um, I know that's something that exists within um, our wrestling club. The wrestling clubs are not going to be having workouts until this virus is lifted. That may not happen for a year. Well, uh, that's a question for USA Wrestling. <laughs> You said that's debatable. debatable. Because there's a lot of people that's running practice right now, um, hands down. You go through your Twitter feed, you go on your Instagram and your Facebook, there's full of practices, there's full of camps. Um, I know that a lot of, some of those are private now. Uh, those that are entrepreneurs, uh, things of that nature versus the school um, uh coaches and things of that nature which they're handled and reasonably so because of what's going on but that's debatable if i could weigh in on that a little bit i think that the usa card is also needed for leverage like i would i would i would ask right now how many african-american coaches in silver and gold level coaches uh, I, I know you are but i'm yeah. saying overall that's a problem and that's a leverage issue there needs to be more silver and gold level coaches in USA wrestling for a lot of reasons. Um, so that's that's the point that I'll uh, weigh in on on that. But in Alabama, I know right now um, there's camps going on and there's certain uh, permissions that we're getting for certain types of practices. And then if it's private, um, they scrapping every day. Whether they should be or not, that's a moral question, but they're scrapping every day. Interesting. I know that. So, I know that's true that they're doing it, but if one of those kids gets sick from the virus. Whoever's running that club, he's gonna have a lawsuit on his hand, and there's no way for him to uh, take care of the the uh, medical bills because he doesn't unless he has private insurance. But he's not gonna have the insurance that comes from that wrestling card. And that, my question, I'm wondering how they're gonna do it. I know they're gonna do it, but I don't think they understand the comp. Uh, 
I, I don't think they really comprehend one of those kids getting that virus. And um, if my if that happens, I don't care if the parent did agree to let them come in there. They may even have a waiver, but I'll guarantee you an attorney's going to tear that club to pieces and that coach yeah. because well, I, it, you can't listen. They're telling you the medical people are saying you can't you can't do this. You, you shouldn't group up. You shouldn't work out. I know that there are going to be coaches that are going to do it. I, I think that, you know, they need to get educated because they're going to hit somebody's pocketbook real hard. Uh, sir, and I, I, let me say one more thing for now. Uh, it's not education. I think everybody on this call that's aware of what you're talking about, especially with the private culture, it's not education. It's money. Right, right. right. The, the, wrestler, the wrestlers aren't as high on the totem pole as that checkbook. That's why they're having those right. practices. Right, right. And, um, that's why I said that's a question of morality. I don't think that is right, um, especially if you and I, you know, because we know that there are certain places on it in the United States that didn't get hit that hard, right? If you're in the Dakotas and things of that nature, I don't think those numbers are that high. Um, not saying I agree with them running practice or not, but I can understand it more. But um, it's a morality question. And if you are a coach that's running practice and all of a sudden you have an outbreak, you're right. That person does deserve whatever comes, especially if they're not following the proper protocol. Right. Because there's some people that don't care. But it ain't, it ain't education. Yeah. Cash, well, there used to be a saying when me and Cornell was in high school. Cash rules everything around me. <laughs> and that goes in wrestling too. Yeah. So that's a good point. I'm going to ask Coach Douglas this. Does he think there's going to be a college wrestling season this year? I don't think there will be a college wrestling season. Uh, I, I don't see how there can be until they get their arms wrapped real tight around this virus and what from what i'm hearing they're six to eight months away from having a a, uh, a a serum to deal with the virus right and then it hey there's somebody's gonna slip through the cracks well they just they just also uh announced that the uh one that they were working on uh wasn't panning out to be what they thought it would be let me ask this question how many on here how many on this call would uh, consider running workouts at their uh, facility or at their school or at their club? Right now? Yeah. How, how many of you guys would be willing to run workouts? I wouldn't because my school would throw me under the bus. So right. I know I wouldn't. And, and, that's what, and that's, I think that's where Bobby's gone. Um, a lot of it's going to – it's a legality issue. It, a lot of – a lot of insurances um, will not, as a matter of fact, they're being given uh, a way out of uh, covering a lot of, you know, a lot of this uh, pandemic thing. Um, so when you don't have the insurance uh, backing, you know, these events, the events are not necessarily going to happen because it's too much of a liability on the institution. So, uh, uh, if I'm wrong, I mean, just tell me. But that, is that what you're you're getting at? It's it's a, it's kind of a catch twenty two. You're selling insurance. That insurance is being uh, given an, an opt out of coverage. So you're basically, um, you know, uh, con conducting a, uh, an activity that is uh, liable, and you're pretty much uninsured. Even if though you, you pay for the insurance. <laughs> if you had a gym, Mike, if you had a gym. No, no, not going to happen. Only, you know what I'm going to ask you. Yep. No, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't happen because I, I don't need the liability. And, and so that, that is, a, that is a, one of those questions. Um, maybe uh, Nate, um, you know, can kind of get Nate had to, He had to jump off. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, that, that falls within, you know, that – that focus on how this is affecting wrestling and wrestlers, you know, uh, and when and there should be um, an answer to that question. Um, 
you know, and I hope, I hope it's a good one because, you know, everything that we're saying and everything that we're doing is predicated on there is a wrestling uh, organization uh, like USA Wrestling and NCAA. Uh, without it, you know, we're all basically uh, talking nonsense. <laughs> I think the NCAA has already said that there, there's no there's no competition. Yeah. They, they didn't say any, I don't know if they said anything about workouts, but I know that no, the no. NJCAA ruled on something. Um, I just got that information that but, they're going to uh, they're planning to conduct uh, practice and, and and things of that nature. Well, I know uh, I talked to a lot of coaches on our podcast and. I'm hearing like college football is going to be played. Yeah. So, so Coach Douglas, if college football is played, is, is wrestling going to be able to still, still go on if they play college football? You know what? Uh, 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 college football is it's a different animal. It's a different animal. A different animal. You're talking about billions of dollars in TV, and they're they're willing they're willing to take a chance. And they can self insure. They can self insure. You know, high risk, uh, self insure. I, I I think if you watch what happens with those professional sports, it'll give you an idea on what you can and can't do in amateur sports. But my thing, as a former coach, and I look at this now, there is knowing what I know, there is no way that I would uh, allow my guys to practice they can't even practice together there's no way that i would run workouts no way hey coach right. douglas let me ask you a question so i live in alabama and in alabama they actually address um what you can and cannot do based on the guidelines um would you would you would it make sense to you, somebody that would be willing to say, hey, let's follow the guidelines? Uh, the guidelines, it depends on what the guidelines are. The guidelines, they can have guidelines, but this virus will kick those guidelines ass. <laughs> it, 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 the guideline says you, you can only work out X amount of time uh, as a college athlete. But we all know that you know, those college athletes work out more than that uh, a lot of the amount of time that they can have. This virus is a totally different animal. We don't know what we're dealing with. Now this, uh, uh, what's the, the president uh, is having this convention. There's going to be some casualties. There, there, there's going to be some flu outcomes. There, there's going to be some lawsuits. That's yeah, that's there's, there's already, I mean, three of his, four of his staff tested positive. What, what, I'm, what I'm recommending, guys, is this. We got to make sure that we don't allow some reckless uh, gunslinger, hot, hot shot coach to have workouts and have a problem where we lose a couple of kids to this virus. We can't let that. It, we 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 got to find a way to making sure that they are aware that hey you 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 can go ahead and sneak around and have workouts but it it'll cost it may cost you your home it may they may send your ass to prison yeah mm -hmm. as a coach as a coach I, I I feel real real uncomfortable if I had to sneak around and have some workouts. Because unless you have some workouts, you're not going to be able to compete. Mm. I, I think part of the thing that's going to, be, going to be interesting is to see what the international people do. But, guys, if, if you take a chance, and, and they're doing it. There, there are a lot of guys working out in their basements. There's a lot of guys working out in their private facilities. There's a lot of guys that are doing that, but they're, they're, they're playing with fire, man. Coach Lanham, have, have you been any, hearing anything from your university on uh, what you guys going to do for football? Uh, right now, I mean, we're planning on August 17th coming back to school. 
So uh, that's the plan. We're a Power Five conference, and you know we're gonna we're, we're planning on having practice. The football team is planning on having practice. You know, we've already started talking about ways that we can. I think bottom line is if you look at our sport, uh, I mean, you know, there's coaches. You know, I'm on calls with Duke coaches, and they they don't they don't even know how to clean their facilities. And you know, that's something that you know we do as wrestling coaches every day. You know, mopping mats, cleaning. So you know, I, I talked about you know, look somebody's going to have to be the tip of the spear in, in order for us to move forward. I, I'm not one that I don't, I'm, I'm like, you know, we got to come up with guidelines. You know, we've, we've, you know, we've got to have a football season and we've got to have a wrestling season. I mean, it, we cannot go two years without an NCAA tournament and we got, we got to figure it out. Now I look at how our sport is more controlled than any sport out there. And I, and I don't think that we're selling that. I mean, look at, look at, look at, you know, if you, if you're talking about dual meets or you take what you, you're talking about dual meets, I mean, you know, you, you know who you're going to, you're going to wrestle before that dual meet. You can take temperatures, you know, after weigh you can clean the scales. After every match, you can clean the, you know, after every do, match, you can clean your mats. So, you know, I feel like we need to start selling the, 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 the how clean wrestling is and how we're ahead of these other these other sports. I mean, how how does wrestling? And I talked to Mike Mori about this. How do we all of a sudden get put in a high risk category? You know, we're not basketball. We're not sharing the same basketball. We're not football where you play a game, and if it doesn't rain, your football is not being clean. Your 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 field's not being clean. Look at wrestling after our events. The mats are clean. They're put up. Look at, you know, and, 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 and programs, you know, I know for a fact our room, our room's clean three times a day and after every individual practice. Our guys' shoes are clean. You know, they're, 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 they're you know, they put foam on their bodies to make sure that they, you know, they're, dis, you know, sanitized. So our story, we, we have to tell our story and I don't uh, think that that's being I, told. I think, I think with that, we probably also have to get some kind of medical you know, uh, some kind of outcomes, you, you know, and that's, a, that's the only thing you can, I mean, because it is, it is, it, you know, it's like the CDC, you, 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 you gotta have to, we're, I mean, we're, if, if we're going to do that, and it sounds like a good idea, uh, but you're going to have to have some the medical community that's going to um, strengthen that, that, that stance without it. It's kind of like, okay, that's a hypothesis, you know, um, that's not been proven yet. So. I, I believe that, uh, Mike. I, I, but you know what? I hear people talking about, you know, I don't want to be the head of the spear. I don't want somebody's with something. Somebody's going to have to do something in order. We just can't sit back and say, all right, you know, who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? And who's not going to do it? I mean, we've got to push forward to come up with guidelines to have our student athletes work out. I mean, we can have individual practice where, where our student athletes can work out, but we got we can't be we can't miss another NCAA tournament because I feel like if we if we go two years without an NCAA tournament, gonna there's going to be a lot of programs being dropped. Yeah, yeah, a lot of programs. Oh. So I figure, you know, we got to figure, and I and I, and this is my beef with Mike Moyer, and we go back and forth with this, you know, Mike, you need to find out, Mike Moyer, you need to find out. Why is wrestling categorized as a high-risk sport? Just, okay, it's body contact. Okay, but, you, you, you know, what about, you know, basketball, you don't know what, what person you're going to guard or football the same way. I mean, we know in an individual duel, I'm going to face that guy. If he has a fever, I'm not going to wrestle. Right. So if you look at that kind of stuff, why aren't we selling that kind of stuff in wrestling? And, and, and there's no answers to that. It's like, oh, well, we're high-risk. Okay, why are we? Yeah, and who who determined that? And that's what I that that's what I asked him, Mike. I said, Mike. I said, how who determined that wrestling all of a sudden is if there's ten, we're a nine, and, right. and that's what I don't. That's give me some answers on that. And what was give the me some answers on that criteria? I mean, why? When they, when they yeah. turn in, when they turn in from the training room, their reports on injuries 
Look at where wrestling stands. Look at where football stands. Look at where the other sports stand. I think it's football's number one, wrestling's number two. I'm talking about injuries. Football one, wrestling two, and then I'm not sure what comes after that. But it's a high awesome. risk, high risk sport. Yeah, but we got two different categories, Coach. We got one that's injuries, and we got one that, you know, you look at football, you know, you're talking about contact with, you know, you in one play you can contact three different people. In wrestling, you know, in the, you can even control that in your wrestling room if you say, okay, at this certain amount, of, at this certain time, we're going to have, five guys and, and, and it's going to be your partner throughout the whole practice. Football can't control that. They, they can't control that. You know, you have a wide receiver goes out, he has to block somebody and then he runs in. So that, that's, that's my frustration with the whole thing. It's like, we got to figure out a way to separate because like you, even like you said, football's a, a, a multi-billion dollar. They can survive. We can't, we, we can't. And two, two tournaments, you know, you watch how many programs, will be dropped if there's not a wrestling tournament uh, this year. Uh, to go with you, Coach Lanham, uh, when you're talking about being the tip of the spear, I think maybe the NCAA and even USA Wrestling needs to be more in contact with UWW as there's a lot of international uh, programs that are getting back on the mat. Um, several have started within the last two months, uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, uh, we need to be in constant contact with them and to see how things are being tracked there and what's happening, not, and rely more on that than relying on other sports or other athletes, kind of like what you said, let's focus within our sport and find out why ours goes that way by talking to say, I know Bulgaria got back on the mat uh, about a month ago. Um, we should be in contact with them. What kind of flare ups have they had because of that? Is, is, is it something we need to worry about that way? Right. I, you know, I was on that call this last Tuesday uh, with USA Wrestling, and they were talking about, you know, all the, all the, the European countries getting back on the mat and getting back. And, and, and you know, USA Wrestling, even they have the they, – they, they're kind of taking the stance of, we don't want to be the first to get this, and we don't want to be the first to get that. And, and my thing is like, look, if, okay, so are we going to be – to continue to, to – to, okay – to drop, to keep on, okay, now we're not doing Fargo. Now we're not doing this. Now, now you know, we, we're, we're, you know we're, we're going backwards. And you, like you said, there, there's not enough. We don't want to be the tip, but we don't want to do the research either. So yeah. find out what these teams are doing. How are they going back to practice? How are they going back? And nobody wants to be, like Coach Douglas said, that hotshot maverick. But <laughs> the, 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 the survival of our sport is at hand. Football will survive this. Basketball will survive this. Wrestling will not survive this if we don't find a way to get our student athletes back on the mat and back competing. We, we won't survive. And, and, and this is a critical time where maybe we have to take some chances to figure this thing out. But I, I think our story is not being told. And I think, and, and I think that's killing us. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and you, you're right. I mean, I just thought about this, um, if you got a hundred percent, you know, um, a group, let's say a tw of twenty, you know, for a uh, team of ten, two uh, two teams, it, and 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 nobody, nobody has COVID. Well, well, how, how could you possibly get it if nobody if nobody has COVID? You know, so yeah, the controls are are there, you know, but like you said, somebody's got to somebody's got to uh, bring that forward and 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 make that as a protocol. In, in going forward, because it, if yeah, there's no way of getting it unless you have it. A pool of um, uh, infected infected uh, wrestlers have it. Right. What about so, the girl? No, no, you're right. But that takes that takes <laughs> that takes some Coach, leadership. You know? What about the girlfriends? Huh? Mm, the girlfriend. Friends. Yeah, but you, you but if you're if you're tested before the match, then you can't wrestle because you were playing you know folly with the girlfriend so right. or 
diaphragm. Uh, but the bottom line is, you, 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 there's it's still a control because before you're able to engage in competition, you 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 have to get a clean bill of health. You know, as at least as far as we know, and I, and, and 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 to your point, it's 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 a, a viable uh, solution to get things back to normal. Yeah, you, you might get, you know, one or two, but the bottom line is it won't, it won't be, um, it, it won't be because they wrestled, it's because they did something else. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But that's, like I said, that's, that's gotta come from the leadership. I mean, USA Wrestling is, you know, uh, an NCAA for NCAA round, they're, they're the leaders in that. I don't know who is responsible for wrestling in NCAA, but like the uh, internationally, USA Wrestling is is the 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 uh, NGB. They would have to bring that up as a pro protocol to the right. UFC. So, all right. all right, guys. Well, I definitely appreciate it. It's been a lot of great knowledge there. I know we can go on to more, but I know people have stuff to do, man. I definitely. Thank you, Coach Douglas, Coach Foy, Coach Lanham, and everybody's on here. Oh, Nike, you still on here? I want to. I, wanted to, uh, I text you, Nike. I want to have your last input before I, before I let everybody go. I know you got to listen. I don't know if you know Nike Fazers, uh, just a great man, great mentor to me, and a great businessman. So, Nike, would you have the last words for us on your input on some sports? I text you. You didn't answer my text, Nike. Yeah, sorry, I I had to deal with a family matter. Well, I, I, I'll be brief. I, first of all, all respect and praise to, to each of you uh, and your journey. You, you, you have all my respect. Uh, you know, I wish uh, elder, some of the elder coaches that were here, I wish they were still here to give them their respect. But I'll say one thing in terms of a contribution that I can make. I heard it early on, you know, the business of wrestling and the business of being a coach, that's something that I can help on. You know, I, I graduated from the Harvard Business School with an MBA. And they've actually built a pretty successful sports and entertainment kind of practice. I know the professor that runs it. What I'd like to do is create for us uh, a program, really a general manager's program to help assistant coaches, associate coaches, head coaches think about the business of wrestling. Because, you know, Harvard Business all it is is a series of case studies. So I can, I can get a case study about fundraising, you know, and the, the, the ins and outs of fundraising, a case study on accounting. Yeah, how to deal with, and so I'm going to, that'll be my contribution, uh, Coach, and um, you and I can coordinate, and then you can get it out to the folks, but this, this, this will be AAA quality stuff, and we really want to create, maybe as part of the, um, of the African American museums that the brothers have talked about, make it a part of their curriculum. Yeah. This is a program that coaches go through, because what we can do, you know, I, I, my philosophy, I really... And I'll, I'm sorry, but, you know, like, people talk about Malcolm X's assassination, and they talk about the CIA, the FBI, the New York Police Department. I talk about those five Negroes that killed him. I focus on the things that I can control. I can't control the CIA and the FBI. So we can talk about the racism of the NC2A, we can talk about this and that. But what I can control is helping to make you brothers better business people. So that when someone talks about an African-American coach, they say, my God, they know that business better than anybody. So that's where I want to focus my energy. So, Coach, I, I commit to uh, contributing that. I'm going to start getting it organized now. And uh, I want to literally build a binder, a training program for all African-American men that want to get into the wrestling business. That's the focus. That's exactly. Teach them how, teach them how to fish. Yes, sir. I love, I love it. No doubt. That's oh, awesome. Man. That's awesome. So, hey, sorry I didn't get more of you in there, IQ, but I knew you would come with some good stuff. So, <laughs> well, it's it's the next steps that matter. So, thank you, brother. Uh, pass me your number um, uh, through the however you can. can. Yeah, I'll send an email to Coach Robinson, and I have him send it out. Absolutely, there you go. There you go. that'll yeah. work. And and I'm connected to everybody, and hopefully, I get the email list going, and we'll have it going there. So, very good. Thank you all. Thank you, Coach thank Douglas. You. <laughs> Make sure you hear me. Thank you, Coach Foy, for putting Coach Douglas on. And I appreciate it. This was definitely good. Thank you, Jonathan. MissouriWrestling.com. Please go check it out. Also, check out the Money Round podcast. Pretty hilarious. Coach Foy, we got to have you on there next.
So anytime, anytime, just give me. I gotta know what I did on the money round. That's what I'm waiting. On. What What was my scores on the money round? I never. Uh, you You're about ninety five percent, Coach. You did good. Hey, you did. Good. All right. That's what I like to hear. Not a lot better than some of our other guests. <laughs> well, you gotta let me know what the money hey, round. I, as long as uh, I was better than Monday, that's all that counts. Coach. <laughs> Coach Ford, we're not gonna let you know what it is. It's a surprise once you get yeah, on there. So. <laughs> Can't know uh, about it coming I'm in. Not, I'm not bringing right. any money. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you do. You gotta bring some money. So. <laughs> All right, guys. I have a good night. I'm about to go with the family, and we're going to axe throwing. So thank you. Bye bye. Good 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 night, gentlemen. Good night, good night gentlemen. Great thank meeting you. all of you and talking to. You. Great job. Thank you, Coach Lamb. Good you night. Awesome. Good night. <laughs> How many people on? We got people on. Coach Glad I'm still on. <laughs> All right. Jonathan still on? No. I think I want him to stay on. That was dope, right? Yeah. I'm gonna remove everybody for a second. Yeah. So go ahead. Give me a second. Jonathan was still on.